You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the 13th part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. All right, I'm back, peons. Back Hugo growled as he stormed into the dorms. When no one immediately reacted, even to groan, he narrowed his eyes. Hey, anyone here? Dude, shut up. Kaminari shouted. If you wanna watch the news with us, get over here, but keep your mouth shut. Back Hugo raised an eyebrow. Kaminari wasn't one to defy him like that, so whatever was on TV had to be good. What, did that all for one guy break out of prison or something? He demanded as he entered the common room. There, he saw the half of the class that didn't have work studies crowded around the television. Silence greeted him, and he almost spoke again. But then he saw what was on the screen. We're coming to you live from what we have been informed is a major Yakuza base of operations, a reporter said. According to our sources, over 70 heroes and over 100 police officers raided this compound, and may also be involved in the rescue of a... A sudden crash made the reporter whirl. The students watched as Chisaki stormed out, followed by a familiar green light. Oh, crap, that's Midoriya. Gyro's jacks twisted nervously. He's fighting that thing. Despite the danger, the reporter and her cameraman remained where they were, giving everyone watching a good view of Deku stopping Chisaki in his tracks, and then utterly crushing him. Aside from the USJ incident, Bakugo had never seen Midoriya truly fight before. He'd seen him spar, and had sparred against him more than a few times, but Midoriya had always held back, for fear of hurting someone. Now, he was watching the boy he'd once tormented fight with almost no restrictions, and it was sobering. There was a savage edge to the way Midoriya fought, but sharpened by training and a mind for tactics, it made Bakugo realize that, if Midoriya really wanted to, he could absolutely destroy almost anyone, including him. Would you have treated him like shit if you'd known how strong he could be? A small part of him asked, You know you wouldn't have. You would have seen him as a rival, yes, but also an equal. You might have even still had him as a friend. But that's over now. He's got friends, and from now on, he's going to look down on you, just like you looked down on him. Back you go scowled, and shoved those thoughts away. Bastard. With your Araka and Sky Dancer's help, the team of students floated out of the wreckage of the Eight Precepts base. As soon as their feet touched the ground, they were swarmed by paramedics and heroes with medical training. The worst injuries among them belonged to Siro, Yeyarazu, and Ashido. The former two had bad gashes and broken bones, and all three had concussions of varying severity. Everyone else either needed some rest, or weren't injured at all. Fortunately, one of the paramedics who had worked with Recovery Girl before assured them that none of their injuries were beyond her ability to heal. Knowing that, and knowing that the fight was truly over, the rising stars began to laugh and joke around. Hey, Shoto. Ashido called out woozily. How come you're spinning? Todoroki glanced over at her. She was laying on a cot in an ambulance, and was about to be taken to the hospital. I'm not, that's the concussion talking. Ashido blinked owlishly. Concussions make you spin. Weird. Todoroki sighed and turned to the paramedic that was finishing a splint on his broken wrist. I honestly can't tell if she's messing with me or not. Bye, Shoto. Ashido waved as the ambulance doors were closed. See you at the hospital. Shoto. Todoroki tensed. He had been focused on Ashido and hadn't noticed Endeavor walking up to him. I want to speak to you. The paramedic made to protest, but Endeavor silenced her with a glare. This will not take long, and his injuries are not critical. I have a broken wrist, and I'm right-handed, Todoroki muttered. You fought well, Endeavor said, ignoring his son's complaints. You need more training, obviously, but you've proven to me that you truly earned that provisional license. Right, because your opinion is more valid than the people whose job it is to test me, Todoroki thought sourly. Regardless, I am proud of you, Endeavor continued. You fought against experienced killers and prevailed with only a few injuries. Todoroki gave his father a piercing glare. It wasn't just me. My friends fought just as hard. To his credit, Endeavor nodded. You're right, Shoto, your classmates performed excellently as well. Should they ever desire an internship with my agency, inform them that they have a standing invitation to prove themselves to me. 
Todoroki blinked. That was the closest Endeavor came to wholesale praise, made all the rarer because it wasn't directed at him. I'll pass it on. Thanks. Endeavor nodded, and turned to leave, but paused. You should hurry on to the hospital. It would not do to keep your girlfriend waiting. Todoroki visibly twitched, and rubbed his head. Mina was the one with the concussion, not me, right? All right, ladies, you can go on your way, the paramedic said kindly. All I need to do is clean up these bandages. There's nothing worse than riding in an ambulance that's full of rags soaked in your own blood. Thanks, Ribbit, Asui said, answering for all the girls still waiting to be taken to the hospital. Yeyurazu and Hata were unconscious, and Yuraka was only still awake because she wanted to see Yuri. Sui ached all over, but at least she hadn't lost blood or broken any bones. Of course, sweetie. The paramedic patted her head. It's my job, after all. The four girls were quickly loaded up into more ambulances and driven off. The paramedic walked off with four bags of blood-stained bandages. With practiced ease, she used a marker to write the name of each girl on the bag that held their respective blood. Once she was out of sight of the heroes and the police, she took out a phone and dialed a number. Hey, Tamira, Toga said gleefully as her quirk wore off. Can I get a portal back to base? I got some of that Yeyorazu girl's blood and a few extras. Good work, Shigaraki praised. We've already got Slice back, but we just ran out of room for the next phase. Darn, I wanted to see how you'd handle it, Toga pouted. Can you at least record it for me? I've got a twice clone holding a camera right now. Oh, goody. Midoriya shuffled anxiously in place. He was the only student who hadn't been whisked away to the hospital, even though he was beyond exhausted, but Nighteye had insisted that he remain behind. We still have to figure out what to do with Chisaki, Nighteye said, not to mention his subordinates that he assimilated. I'm not even sure if they're still alive. Regardless, unless we have a way to separate them, I believe that you will be necessary in escorting Chisaki to prison. Midoriya blinked stupidly, as his brain tried to comprehend his mentor's words, as well as figure out the idea that was slowly forming in his mind. Actually, I think I have an idea, he said wearily. Can I try something? Nidai hesitated, then nodded. Midoriya barely managed to walk over to Chisaki, still in his monstrous form. With some effort, he dredged up enough energy to turn into Ghost Freak, and then flew into Chisaki's body. A moment later, with heroes and police watching tensely, Chisaki stirred and opened his eyes. Oh, that doesn't feel good, Chisaki grumbled. I can feel all his pain. This really hurts. Midoriya, Endeavor had a ball of fire in one hand, but he didn't look like he was about to attack. That is you? Yes. Yes, sir. Chisaki brought one hand to his chest, and the entire monster body exploded. When it reformed, Katsukame, Kirono, Rappa and Nomoto were back to normal, albeit unconscious. Chisaki then held out his hands. Can someone put some cuffs on him before I leave? A police officer quickly put a pair of cork-suppressing handcuffs around Chisaki's wrists. Oddly, that actually forced Ghost Freak out of the man. Apparently, the cork-suppressing technology could affect him, even while possessing someone else. Midoriya turned back to normal and immediately sank to his knees. Chisaki, still unconscious, also collapsed, but the same officer grabbed him before his head hit the ground. Thank you, Midoriya, Nidai said, awkwardly patting the student on the shoulder. That makes things much easier. I'll have you brought to the hospital now. You might not be injured, but after a major operation like this, it is wise to allow a doctor to look at you. Yes, Sir Nidai. Midoriya fought to keep his eyes open. Eri was okay, right. Nidai almost smiled. Lamillion has been keeping me apprised of her condition. Likely, he wants me to tell you. She is badly shaken, obviously, but she is unharmed. I have no doubt that she will feel better after seeing you all, and knowing that Chisaki is defeated. Midoriya nodded, he also came close to smiling, but Chisaki was still in his line of sight. I know I feel better. Good. Nidai gently pushed him in the direction of an ambulance. Go celebrate with your friends. You have earned it. We can deal with the aftermath once you have all recovered. Mere moments after Midoriya was gone, Nidai spotted Fat Gum exiting the ruins of the compound, with something buried in the folds of his body. Where have you been? Sky Dancer demanded. The fight's been over for a while now. Fat Gum didn't look the least bit sorry. Hey, I was busy keeping these two safe while half the building collapsed. Night I watched with some bemusement as two children poked their heads out of Fat Gum's body to breathe in fresh air. He wasn't the only one to be a little confused. Even Endeavor did a double take. Sky Dancer put it best. What the heck? Yuraka had never been so glad to see Recovery Girl. True, she lectured them all on not getting hurt and she waved her cane dangerously close to their faces, but only after healing them with her quirk. 
It left them even more exhausted than before, but at least they didn't need stitches or casts. I am never complaining about Aizawa sensei always being sleepy ever again, Siro mumbled, half asleep. Not if he deals with this sort of crap when he's not teaching us. I'm reasonably sure he also has insomnia, Yeyurazu said as she absently ran her fingers through her hair. But, yes, this is the kind of day we may have to face again as heroes. With broken bones, Ashido groaned. A quick check from Recovery Girl had revealed that her skull had been fractured, and she still had a headache. Can we have less of those, please? Ida, one of the only members of the team who hadn't suffered any injuries, tried not to wallow in misplaced guilt. I do not think we will often face villains who can literally become an entire room and attack us while we are fighting other villains. Kirishima laughed. Yeah, I think today would have been hard for some pros, so don't beat yourself up. Ashido grinned, but a spike of pain turned it into a grimace. I think the villains beat me up enough, thanks. Can we just try to have fewer one-on-one -on -one fights? Todoroki asked, and handed his girlfriend a chunk of ice. It's easier if we all attack the bad guys together. He's got a point, Ribbit, Asui said. We can't all be Izuku. Uraraka frowned. Speaking of which, where is he? I don't think he was hurt, but it's not like him to leave us alone. Ashido held the ice to her head and laughed. Maybe he stopped to get you flowers. That'd be romantic. Is that a hint towards me? Todoroki asked. No, we both got hurt, so you're off the hook. Ashido shifted to face him and fluttered her eyelashes. Plus, you went plus ultra to beat the guy who knocked me out. That's way sexier than flowers. Maybe it was the fatigue getting to him, but Todoroki was so flustered that a bit of fire shot from his left cheek, right above a bright blush. Thankfully, the universe decided to save him further embarrassment, because Midoriya took that moment to enter their room. Guys, are you all okay? Uraraka smiled brightly. Deku-kun, Midoriya was nearly tackled off his feet by his girlfriend. She hadn't run into him very hard, but he was exhausted. She kissed him then, maybe a little fiercer than she normally would have in front of others, but today had been an emotionally charged day. Midoriya blushed, both from the kiss and because he realized that his girlfriend was only wearing a hospital gown. Siro grinned, I'd say get a room, but I don't think there are any empty ones here. You'll have to hold it in until you get back to UA. Uraraka had her eyes closed as she leaned into Midoriya's chest, but she managed to aim a rude gesture right at Siro's face. That was particularly impressive, since Siro was behind her. Achako, Yeyurazu exclaimed, but everyone else just laughed. Hey, Izuku, Asui said, once everyone had calmed down, and Midoriya sat next to his girlfriend on her hospital bed. What took you so long, Ribbit? Midoriya grimaced. I was helping secure Chisaki. I possessed him as Ghost Freak and used his quirk to undo what he'd become. Then I held him still until the police could cuff him. He was unconscious, but I was being careful. Ida scowled with uncharacteristic bitterness. It might be unbecoming to say so, but I was hoping that he would remain like that. His looks finally matched his soul. Amen, brother, Kirishima called out. The most important thing is that Chisaki has been defeated, Yeyurazu reminded them and that we are all okay. Tell that to my headache, Ashido complained. Midoriya was about to add his two yen, but then his phone buzzed, and he looked at a text. Speaking of being okay, Nezu-sensei just got here. He's talking to the doctors about getting her removed here. He thinks it will calm her down. She is all right, right? Uraraka asked, immediately more tense. She had been only partially successful at hiding her anxiety over the little girl, and wouldn't be happy until Iri was safe with her. As far as the rising stars were concerned, family. She doesn't have a scratch on her, Midoriya promised, and his friends collectively sighed in relief. I am going to buy Mirio every birthday present he has ever wanted, Yeyurazu sighed. Let me know when you wrap those presents so I can add my name to them, Ashido said. Siro raised his hand. Same, Yeyurazu arched an eyebrow. Will you help pay for them? Ashido and Siro just grinned unrepentantly. Everyone else laughed, a combination of relief that the battle was over in genuine humor and almost missed the door opening. Midoriya immediately realized that it wasn't a doctor that opened the door, but a familiar mouse bear dog and a little girl. Izu, Chako, Iri darted past Nezu and sprinted towards them. Iri, Midoriya and Uraraka were already moving to intercept her. The rest of their friends almost followed, but they knew that this first moment was for those three alone. Oh, Iri-chan, Uraraka took the girl in her arms and hugged her for all her worth. I'm so glad you're okay. Midoriya would have agreed, but he was too busy crying to actually say anything, so he settled for hugging them both. Or why you hurt? Iri asked, once the sobs had faded. Uraraka wiped her own eyes, then glanced back at her friends. Some were in hospital gowns, like her, and they all could use a shower, but they were all smiles and happy tears. No, Iri-chan, she said. We're all going to be fine. 
Th then you kept your promise. Dari hugged Yuraraka and Midoriya again. Thank you. No one immediately reacted, because they were too busy staring at Ari. For the first time since meeting her, the little girl had a smile on her face. It was small, but it was genuine, like the kind a child has when their parents reassure them after a nightmare. And that was exactly what it was. Eri's nightmare was over. Midoriya gently picked her up. Let's give everyone a little time to get cleaned up, and then we can go home. Shigaraki's smile was so wide that it almost hurt. Today had been a great day for the League, their rival had just been crushed, and more and more pieces were coming together for the project he and the doctor were working on. In fact, just before the final part of the day's operation was set to begin, the doctor had called Shigaraki to tell him that the bullet he'd been analyzing had provided an unexpected windfall in that department. It had also opened up a new opportunity to accelerate the process, but he wanted Shigaraki to provide him with another blood sample. When Shigaraki was told who to get the blood from, he'd been happy to oblige. Warp gate coming up in 60 seconds, Spinner called out. Get ready to move. Kirajiri said we might arrive a little close to the targets. That's fine by me, Shigaraki said. That way, we can't miss. Everyone, remember the plan twice? Your job is to keep the cops busy, but don't cause such a big scene that they lock down the city. Chimera, Dabai, you take down any heroes that get in the way. Compress, stop the convoy, Slice and I will go after the targets. His teammates for this mission nodded eagerly, especially Slice. She had been disappointed that a clone had been sent to infiltrate the eight precepts, not the real her, and had been looking forward to getting revenge. Shigaraki was the last person to deny someone on his side revenge, as long as it was convenient for him. Five seconds, Spinner shouted, entering warp gate now. The light inside the van they'd stolen briefly darkened, and then they were on a completely different freeway. Chimera kicked the rear doors off the van, and Shigaraki grinned again when he saw the police convoy. Considering the people they were hauling away to prison, Shigaraki wasn't surprised by the sight of over 50 police cars, though that didn't deter him in the slightest. Compress, now. Mr. Compress leaned out and tossed a handful of marbles. And now, the opening act. As soon as the marbles reached the lead police cruisers, they expanded into the boulders Compress had hidden away. Two cars were lifted clear into the air and crashed back down to earth. Several others crumpled into twisted wreckage when they collided with the rocks. The rest of the convoy skidded to a halt, unable to go forward with a barricade of stone in the way. Shigaraki laughed at the destruction wreaked in his name. With the police escort stalled, twice took his cue. He quickly created a small flood of clones that poured out of the van. They nearly tripped over themselves as they jumped onto other police cars, jumping and hollering and generally creating a nuisance. His small army could have easily killed the surprised police officers, but twice wasn't in the habit of killing people just because they were in his way. He only killed if he was genuinely angry. That didn't change when the startled officers drew their guns and started firing. Besides, every clone destroyed was replaced by two more. Halt, villains. Two costumed heroes got out of a police car, then punched a hole in the living wall of Twice's and charged at Shigaraki. The one who had shouted was a muscular blonde man with a sleeveless combat vest. The other was a thin man in an all-black outfit, save for his stylized skull-shaped mask. Only two heroes. Shigaraki sneered. I expected more. Chimera, Dabai, deal with them. Slice, let's go. The muscular hero jumped in front of him. Shigaraki raised an eyebrow when the man's arms turned into sand. You think you can just ignore me, Shigaraki Tamura? You won't escape me, nor will you escape your sins. Snatch, stop preaching and start fighting, the other hero said, and then abruptly vanished. Shigaraki spotted movement out of the corner of his eye and realized that the other hero had just jumped out of his shadow to attack him. He was too close for Shigaraki to bring his hands to bear, but Slice's reflexes were as sharp as her quirk. Her hair lashed out from four different directions. She would have impaled the hero, but he disappeared again. Shade dart, focus on Slice. Snatch shouted, I'll handle Shigaraki. That wasn't a bad idea. Shigaraki mused as a tendril of sand wrapped around his hand. He couldn't use decay on the individual grains, and Shade dart was keeping Slice occupied by going in and out of every shadow in the area. There were just two problems with their strategy. First, it was almost noon, and the shadows weren't as large as they could have been, so Shade Dart had limited options to spring from. Second, their plan didn't account for Shigaraki having backup. When Shade Dart jumped out of Slice's shadow to punch her, he was caught in the jaw by Chimera. He flew a good 20 feet back, bounced across the freeway once, and then rolled to his feet. Half his mask was shattered, 
and blood flowed freely from his mouth. Now free of distractions, Slice cut the tendril of sand connecting Shigaraki to Snatch. Once the sand was severed from his body, it was as harmless as a walk on the beach. Fortunately for Snatch, he didn't seem to be able to run out of sand, and his arm quickly reformed. However, he had to create a shield to prevent Dabai from incinerating him. The sand held, but the outer edge of the shield was starting to glow from the heat. You're not so tough, Dabai taunted. All you do is make sand, big deal. Snatch glowered. You. Dabai raised an eyebrow. Do I know you? No, but I know you. Your victims are all over Japan. Burning to death is a horrible way to die, and you have caused much suffering. Well, would you look at that? I think I have a fan. You are the worst kind of criminal. Snatch went on as he created an enormous lion out of sand. You kill and maim and torture, with no thought for how the families of your victims continue to suffer. Dabai scoffed. Everyone suffers, that's life. It's not like I had anything against those guys I killed, they were just in my way. Kinda like you, actually. No hard feelings. Before Snatch could speak again, his entire upper half vanished into a marble, while the rest of him abruptly flopped over and spurted blood. Snatch, Shade Dart tried to vanish into a shadow, but the blow to his head had robbed him of his focus. Rather than disappear, he slowly morphed into a black line and headed for a police car's shadow, before he reached safety. Chimera grabbed the lion and hauled him back. I wonder what'll happen if I attack you like this. Chimera wondered out loud. He grabbed both ends of the wriggling line, took a deep breath, and breathed a beam of heat right onto the center. There was a scream of agony, and then Shade Dart reverted to his human form, burned from the inside out. Dabai whistled appreciatively. Damn, that was brutal. Never had a chance to burn someone from the inside before. Chimera grunted and dusted off his hands. Looks like anything that hits him in his shadow form hurt his veins first. Felt like grabbing blood. He glanced over at what was left of Snatch. Compress got him. Just his top half. Looks like he could only make that part of himself into sand, so he's dead. Dabai shrugged, then looked over at Slice. How's it going? We've only got a few minutes before more heroes show up. Slice waved some of her hair in his direction. The first two transports just had Chisaki's expendable muscle. We're opening up the third now. Chimera put a cigar in his mouth, then lit it with a tiny application of his quirk. Hey, twice, any problems with the cops? No way, man. A clone shouted. We can keep these guys busy all day. Yeah, another clone jeered. They're gonna run out of bullets before we run out of us. Remind me to ask him for some clones later, Dabai commented. I could use some target practice. I heard that. The real twice yelled from inside the league's van. They knew he was the original because he was the only twice holding a phone to record the mayhem. And I don't like the idea of watching you kill me over and over. I'm not killing you, just a bunch of copies, Dabai retorted, then looked back when he heard a triumphant shout. I think they found Chisaki. You should go see what they do to him so you can show Toga. Right, on it. Twice ran past the crowd of clones. Keep up the good work, Twice's. Shigaraki was on the verge of laughing as he destroyed the transport holding Chisaki. Behind him, Slice was already extracting blood from Kirono, and just for good measure, cut off his hair with her own along with a good portion of his scalp. Shigaraki couldn't help but nod in approval at her when Kirono started to scream. Hello, Chisaki, Shigaraki said as he dragged his would-be rival out of the police van. The Yakuza boss was strapped to a gurney by a dozen thick belts, and his hands were bound with quirk-suppressing cuffs. That Midoriya really did a number on you, didn't he? I think this might be the first time I'm thankful that a hero did his job. I get my revenge. And I barely had to do any work. Chisaki glared up at him as Shigaraki unceremoniously dumped him on the ground. Are you planning to kill me? I thought about it, Shigaraki admitted. But then I had an idea. See, killing you, even doing it slowly, is so final. Instead, I thought I'd make sure you live, knowing that I'm going to take everything you worked for, and do it better than you. What are you talking about? Shigaraki leaned in close. See, I have a very smart friend, and he's already figured out how to make those bullets of yours permanent, without needing to torture a little girl. Heck, we don't even need her at all, just that one bullet you left behind. All of that was a lie, of course. Even if the doctor figured out how to replicate the quirk-destroying bullets, neither he nor Shigaraki wanted that kind of weapon in play. The doctor didn't want it because he was dedicated to the understanding and evolution of quirks, not their destruction and Shigaraki didn't want to risk his enemies getting their hands on something like that. It did, however, give Shigaraki immense satisfaction as Chisaki bought his lie hook, line and sinker. Oh, there's more, he went on. 
I get that you hate quirks, but you're also really proud of yours. I wonder what would happen if I took away your ability to use it. Shigaraki placed his hand on Chisaki's elbow. Instantly, it began to decay, and the destruction began to spread beyond the point of contact. Oops, can't have it go too far. We don't want you dying before you watch me win. Slice, Slice grinned as she brought down her hair. She severed the decaying arm at the bicep, then hacked off his other arm at the elbow. Chisaki screamed not just in pain but also denial. Without his hands, his quirk may as well not exist. I think I'll take this, Shigaraki said, taking the hand that wasn't already crumbling to dust. Hands are kind of my thing, right? Again, a lie? Shigaraki was going to deliver the hand to the doctor. He had only been asked for a blood sample, but since Chisaki's quirk relied on his hands, Shigaraki figured that giving the whole thing would be safer. Regardless, it filled Chisaki with despair and impotent fury. Don't worry too much, Chisaki, Shigaraki taunted. You might as well be a quirkless nobody now, but I'll make sure some part of your dream comes true. By the time I'm done, the heroes will be nothing but a memory. You can hear all about it from whatever hole they dump you in. Twice gave his boss a thumbs up from behind his camera, while Slice smiled cruelly at Chisaki. Now that their revenge was complete, Dabai and Chimera just walked on, ignoring Chisaki like trash on the sidewalk. Only Mr. Compress gave the former overhaul any sort of respect, sweeping off his hat and giving a theatrical bow, mocking though it was. Spinner, tell Kirajiri to get us out of here, Shigaraki called out, and got a thumbs up from the lizard man. Twice, we're leaving your clones to cover our escape. You got it, boss. Twice raised his voice to be heard over the sound of fighting. Okay, mess, hold the line. Don't make any more, we need to keep things quiet for now. We read you loud and clear. A clone shouted, then turned to spread the word to the others. Chimera elbowed twice with gruff fondness. I can't wait for the day when you don't have to hold back. Slice winked at twice, who immediately blushed so hard that it could be seen through his mask. That'll be a show I won't want to miss. Shigaraki rolled his eyes, but wasn't annoyed, despite everything. Even knowing that he would willingly sacrifice any or all of the league if it meant his victory, he'd become a little fond of them. Come on, everyone, he said, let's go home. This has been a good day. Dezu stared into his tea, which had long since cooled. Today had been a wild ride for everyone involved, but it had been tragically cut short for some. Iri might have been rescued, but 28 police officers had been injured by the League, some critically, and two heroes had been killed. The loss of Shade Dart had been a personal blow for Nezu. The man had been a UA student 10 years ago, and he'd done his alma mater proud. It wasn't all tragedy, though. The two children Fat Gum had rescued had been identified as Detective Ishigami's grandchildren. They had been kidnapped several weeks earlier, and used as leverage to force Ishigami to give Iri to the eight precepts. Upon learning of his grandchildren's safety, Ishigami had burst into tears in the interrogation room, and bowed as low as he could, babbling apologies and begging for forgiveness. Regardless of why, he would still lose his job, and likely spend some time in prison but he would get a lighter sentence because of the circumstances. Still, relations between heroes and the police were frayed and would be for some time. Quite a day, huh? All Might said as he entered Nezu's office. The principal sighed. This is the second time that our security was compromised, Toshinori. I don't like it. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave that particular weakness alone, All Might said. Unless you want to insist that every visitor wear quirk suppressors, which will never fly. You're right, of course. We must give some people the benefit of the doubt. Without trust, the entire system will collapse. Nezu glanced up. Speaking of collapsing, are you sure you should be up and about? This was the first time you've transformed since Kamino. All Might smiled. Don't worry, I can manage my muscle form for about an hour a day now. Heck, not transforming or doing any hero work since Kamino gave me time to heal, so I might have extended how much longer I can use my powers at all. I suppose that's something. Nezu looked at another report on his desk. The students who are part of the raid will be returning to UA tonight. None of them were seriously hurt, and Recovery Girl gave them a clean bill of health. That's a relief to hear. All Might took out his phone and looked at it. Have you seen any of the articles about young Midoriya? People are astounded by what he did to Chisaki. Some of them are already calling him one of the greatest heroes of his generation. He chuckled. I didn't even get that kind of reputation until I came back from America. That reminds me, Nezu slid a plastic card across his desk to the other man. It was completely transparent, save for a tiny golden strip on one edge. Once the rankings come out, are you going to tell Endeavor? All Might picked up the card and stared at it for a moment. No, the rankings are a formality and we all know it. Call the meeting for tomorrow, and I'll bring Endeavor in after he's done with his reports. He sighed. 
You know, I considered bringing young Mirio into the circle as well, but I don't know how he would take it. Secrets tend to shake him. Maybe you should let Midoriya-san in? Nezu suggested. I believe he could keep that kind of secret, especially since Midoriya knew truths that made All Might's secret club look inconsequential, though Nezu kept that to himself. All Might winced. I considered it, but Nezu's eyes narrowed slightly. You still don't trust him. It's not that I want to distrust him, All Might protested. He's a good kid, and I'm sure he'll be an amazing hero. The fault is entirely mine. I can't help but associate someone with that many powers with all for one. Nezu just shook his head. This had been going on since the entrance exam and All Might had confessed his reservations to him several times. Nezu wasn't concerned that All Might would confront Midoriya over his issues, but he didn't like how Japan's former symbol of peace could be so distrusting of someone who just wanted to help people. When you get over yourself, I expect you to apologize to him, he said curtly. I promise. Good. Nezu shuffled some papers on his desk. Now, since you're here, you can help me with this paperwork. All Might coughed exaggeratedly and got to his feet. Oh, gee, I don't feel good, sir. Maybe I pushed myself too hard this morning. I should go lie down. Sit down, Toshinori. All Might sat down. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Midoriya flinched when half his class shouted their greetings when he opened the door. Behind him, Kirishima's arms hardened, and a small burst of flame shot out from Todoroki's face. Th thanks, everyone, Midoriya stammered. But could you please keep it down? We have Iri with us, and she's still. Kaminari nodded in understanding. They had learned from the news that Iri had been kidnapped, and they all knew how skittish the girl could be before that. You got it, dude. Still, we have some leftover dinner, if you guys want any. That sounds great, Kirishima said as they walked inside. That hospital food they gave us sucked. Are you sure you're all okay, yeah Momo? Jairo asked when she noticed that Yeyorazu was walking a little gingerly. I'll be all right, Jairo-chan, Yeyorazu promised. Recovery girl said that I just need to rest for a few days. All of us do, actually. Speaking of the next few days, Ida said, loudly enough that the whole class could hear. Thiri has asked to spend some time in our dorm, instead of her usual room. Please be on your best behavior and keep the volume down. Some of the students glanced over at Yuraraka who had Iri propped up in one arm. The little girl had buried her face into the crook of Yuraraka's neck when the class had shouted, and refused to look at anyone. I'll take her to my room, Yuraraka said quietly, then addressed Iri. Do you want me to bring you anything? Iri shook her head. Not hungry, she mumbled. Okay, but I'll come back as soon as I'm done. Yuraraka smiled apologetically at Midoriya. Sorry, Deku-kun. Midoriya took his girlfriend's free hand and gave her a quick kiss on the cheek, in full view of his classmates who let out soft coos or wolf whistles. It's fine, he said, smiling kindly through his burning blush. Iri needs this. Once Iri was put to bed, the half of the class that didn't have work studies was quick to bombard the half that did with questions about the raid. Now that it was over, the rising stars and Kirishima were happy to talk about anything that hadn't been deemed top secret. Mostly, that was about what Iri had been put through and the quirk-destroying bullets. I still can't believe those monsters would kidnap a sweet little angel like Iri. Hagakira said with uncharacteristic venom. I don't care why, that's just unforgivable. Kaminari was quick to agree. Yeah, it almost makes me glad that the League of Villains attacked them. Yeyorazu frowned. As much as we hate the eight precepts, we are all planning to become heroes. That means that we must follow the law and not take it into our own hands. While I cannot say that I am not happy the Yakuza were punished, the League still killed several people and hurt more. Please remember that, Kaminari. All right, sorry. Midoriya nodded absently. He was conflicted about the attack on the police convoy. In his mind, the only good thing was that, without his hands, there was now no way that Chisaki could ever be a threat to Eri again. Still, guilt gnawed at him. If I had just killed Chisaki, there wouldn't have been a convoy for the League to attack, and those police and heroes would still be alive. He knew it was irrational, and Sir Nighteye had told him as much after they had heard the news, but that was still how he felt. Nighteye had said that the guilt would fade after a few days, but had promised to talk to him if it got worse. Midoriya appreciated that, and reminded himself to get the man a present as thanks. Maybe a book of jokes. It couldn't hurt. Later that night, Midoriya was in his room, trying to get to sleep. He was exhausted, but he kept thinking about the raid, and how things could have gone very differently either way. He tossed and turned as he thought, and nearly threw his blankets into the air when someone knocked on his door. H hello, he called out softly. Deku-kun, the sound of Yuraraka's nervous voice had him tense and also confused. 
Can we come in? Iwi, Yuraraka meant her in Iri. The little girl was in a set of green pajamas, while Yuraraka wore shorts and a t-shirt. Midoriya, also in shorts and a t-shirt, let them in. What's wrong? He asked. Yuraraka smiled. Nothing's wrong. It's just that Iri was a bit torn. She wants to spend the night with both of us, so I was wondering if I'm her face practically glowed red. Can we spend the night with you? Midoriya blinked. Oh, oh, um yes. Iri shuffled over and hugged his leg. Thank you, Izo. Midoriya felt his heart melt when he saw Iri's tiny smile again. He picked her up and carried her to the bed. Iri crawled into his side and sighed happily, then held her hands out to Yuraraka. Izu is really warm, she said innocently. Still red-faced, Yuraraka tentatively joined them under the covers. Iri was between them, but this was still way beyond what the couple was prepared for. Finally, after what felt like hours of awkward silence, Yuraraka snuggled closer so that Iri was tucked between them. Midoriya slowly reached out, then paused, silently asking Yuraraka for permission to go further. She nodded and he brushed her hair behind her ear and gently stroked her cheek. He kissed the top of Iri's head. Good night, Iri-chan. He then leaned forward and kissed Yuraraka on the lips. Good night, Achako-chan. Yuraraka glanced down at Iri, now fast asleep and smiling contentedly. Good night, Deku-kun. After a little more time spent holding each other and their little girl, they fell asleep, all three finally at peace. When Midori woke up, the first thing he saw was his girlfriend's face. At first, he was confused, then he remembered last night, and briefly panicked. But when Iri yawned and cuddled even closer to him, he calmed down. This was, upon reflection, actually really nice. Yuraraka woke up next, and Midoriya could see the same confusion and panic in her eyes, followed by a shy smile. Gee good am morning, Midoriya whispered. Yuraraka blushed. H hi. She leaned closer and kissed him. Thanks for letting us stay. This meant a lot to Iri. Her blush intensified. And me. I like this. And me tea too. Your stutter is adorable. Then Yuraraka's eyes went wide when she realized she'd said that out loud. Um, I'm gonna take Iri back to my room and get ready for the day. Midoriya gently grabbed her hand before she moved away. Without a word, he pulled her back for another kiss. Yuraraka leaned into it, and they continued to kiss for several minutes, until another yawn from Iri got their attention. As sorry, Midoriya mumbled. Don't be, Yuraraka said, and scooped Iri into her arms. Maybe, maybe we can do this again. If Iri needs it, I mean. Really, Midoriya stared at her for a moment and then nodded dumbly. He lay in bed for a while longer after Yuraraka and Iri were gone, processing everything that had happened, both before and after he went to sleep. He spotted the picture of Ben on his desk. He knew it was his imagination, but it almost felt like Ben was laughing at him. Shut up, he muttered. Yuraraka knew her friends were suspicious of something that morning. She wasn't sure if they knew what had happened, but they knew something had happened. Thankfully, they were kind enough to wait until Iri went to stay with Nezu, because the students still had classes and work studies, and couldn't take care of her all day before confronting her. Okay, Achako, Spill, Ishido demanded, when the girls of the Rising Stars were eating breakfast. You and Midori have been acting weird all morning. Yuraka squirmed in her chair. Is that really any of your business, Mina? You're dating my twin, and you're one of my best friends, Ashido told her flatly. You'd better believe it's my business. You're not really Izuku's sister, Yuraraka muttered, a little petulantly. Just tell us, Ribbit, Asugi said, not looking up from her food. If you don't, she'll just bug you forever. Or she'll go after Izuku, and he'll crack. Yuraraka sighed, she was about to say something, but then started looking all around, including up. Ye Yurazu tilted her head. Achako, what are you doing? Checking to see if Shoji or Gyro are close enough to hear, Yuraraka explained absently. And I'm pretty sure Hagakure was wearing clothes, but I'm just trying to see if she's close. And why would you look up? Just in case Minta was sticking to the ceiling to look down our shirts or something. Ye Yurazu opened her mouth to protest. But she realized that the first three students Yuraraka had mentioned did indeed pose a risk to any conversation that necessitated privacy. And Minta was a scourge upon the entire female population, and should always be considered a risk. Okay, so we're good, Ashido said impatiently. Tell us the goods. Yuraraka gave them all a piercing stare. You promise to keep this to yourselves. After getting three nods, she sighed. Okay, so last night, Iri was still. Tense, understandable, Yeyorazu commented. But Ashido shushed her. Well, she was in my room, but she really wanted to see me and Izuku. Izuku and I, Yeyorazu corrected. And then Ashido put a hand on her mouth. So I took her to Izuku's room, and we stayed the night. Yuraraka closed her eyes and braced for the inevitable. Sui finally looked up. Her eyes were comically large, even when counting her quirk. 
You stayed the night with Izuku. Yes, I'm guessing neither of you slept on the floor. Yes, so, you slept with him. Yes, but not like that. Iraraka sighed. Iri stayed with us. She needed us with her. When Uraraka finally opened her eyes, she was surprised, rather than gleeful smiles. Her three friends looked like they were about to cry. That is, Ashido sniffled. The absolute sweetest thing I've ever heard. Yei Yurazu wiped her eyes. Will Iri need both of you with her to sleep for the foreseeable future? Maybe. Uraraka shrugged helplessly. If she needs us, we'll do this again. I don't think Izuku and I are ready to take that step. Without a little girl as your chaperone, Asui amended. Right? Uraraka decided not to include that she had basically asked her boyfriend if she could spend the night with him again. You two are such good parents, Ashido said. We're not. Uraraka stopped and dropped her head onto the table. Oh, who am I kidding? If we weren't Iri Chan's parents before, we definitely are now. Asui started counting on her fingers. You've saved her from bad guys twice. You spend as much free time with her as possible. And now you help keep the nightmares away. Yeah, you're her parents, Ribbit. Maybe you and Izuku should ask Tenya to put you in contact with his parents, Yeyorazu suggested. They were both heroes and they managed to raise a family. That Yuraraka blinked. That's actually a good idea. I'll talk to Izuku about that. Thanks, Momo. Yeyorazu smiled, then looked at her phone when it beeped. Oh, class is going to start soon. We need to get ready. Yuraraka couldn't help but sigh in relief, compared to everything she'd been dealing with for the last few days, especially the last 24 hours. School sounded like a vacation. After their usual classes, all the students who had participated in the Eight Precepts raid were driven to Night Eyes Agency, where all their mentors were waiting. First of all, I want to congratulate you on a job well done, Night Eyes said, looking each student in the eye. Your work studies have another week to finish, but I sincerely doubt that you will be part of any further cases during that time. You can look forward to a week of training and light patrols. With the eight precepts effectively destroyed, trigger production will cease, Ingenium said. There's still some on the streets, but once it's used up, that drug will basically be extinct. Nice work. The only hiccup in the entire operation was the attack on the convoy, Endeavor added. And that was something none of us could have foreseen or had anything to do with. Regardless, if this is the kind of work you are willing to commit to, expect busy days as pro heroes. No one mentioned that Sir Night Eye technically could have foreseen the attack, but only if he'd used his quirk on anyone who was actually going to be there. Instead, the students all bowed respectfully. If it means stopping monsters like Chisaki, Tagata said, we'll do everything in our power to succeed. Rukiu chuckled. Now that the formalities are out of the way, we'll leave you all to have some fun. We brought some food for you to enjoy. We'll join you once we handle some last-minute reports. Ashido, Kirishima and Hato cheered, and the others shared smiles. Even Amajiki looked happy to spend time with them all. By the time the pros had left, the students had broken up into smaller groups to chat. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen, Hato said, grabbing Amajiki with one hand and Midoriya with the other. I promised that we'd have a double date. And that's what we're gonna do. Midoriya shared a look with Uraraka. They hadn't spoken much since that morning, but that was mostly because they had been processing what had happened. Not out of awkwardness. Sure, Midoriya said, answering for both of them once Uraraka nodded. Did you have something in mind? Hato grinned. Some of the third-year students set up a karaoke machine in our dorm. Uraraka smiled back. That sounds fun. When can we go? Tonight. Hato managed to snag all three in a group hug. Who? This is gonna be so much fun. Hato had been far from quiet, so Ishido heard her. Aw, they already set up a thing. Shoto, we need to go on a date. Todoroki shrugged. Can we do something a little quieter? Karaoke isn't something I'm comfortable with. Ishido considered that. How about a movie, snacks, and cuddles? Todoroki did an admirable job of looking nonchalant. That sounds fine. Yeyorazu watched with some bemusement as her friends chatted and planned dates. It's almost like yesterday never happened. Tagata elbowed her, it was light by his standards, but it still almost knocked her over. Hey, we all need ways to distress. Ida shook his head. Still, it feels like a disservice to those who died yesterday. Look at it this way, we could focus entirely on the work, and burn ourselves out looking for the League, and then we'll be totally useless if we're actually needed, or we could recharge, and look at the problem with fresh eyes. Tagata shrugged. Besides, as Night Eye keeps telling me, we're still students. We'll have to deal with all this dark stuff full time when we're pro heroes, so let's enjoy ourselves while we still can. He has a point, Yeyorazu admitted, then looked around. Where did Hanta and Su go? Tagata looked over his shoulder. That corner. Yeyorazu turned, saw her two friends making out when they thought no one was looking, and quickly turned back. I see. 
Her blush was nearly as red as her costume and went all the way to her hairline. To God aside, dang it, that reminds me that I was gonna ask out Melissa, but after yesterday, I was so exhausted that I forgot. Yeyorazu grimaced at Ida. Are we the only ones among our friends that aren't even considering finding a suitable partner? Ida adjusted his glasses. I believe so. Nina is never going to leave us alone. All Might waited patiently in front of what could charitably be described as the blandest building in Japan. You could walk by it a thousand times and likely never be able to remember anything about it. It was barely bigger than a large house with a for lease sign over the door that had long since faded. Its paint was well maintained, but a mix of beige and gray, and the windows were tinted. The phone number under the sign was completely false. There was someone who answered, but their job was to misdirect anyone who, for some reason, might be interested in such a boring building. All Might nodded as his companion joined him. Endeavor, I'm glad you made it on time. What's this about? Endeavor crossed his arms. I'm a busy man, All Might. I know, but this is important. All Might opened the door to the building. Come with me, we can speak privately in here. Like the outside, the inside of the building was bland, with grey tiles and grey ceiling. Even the lights felt like they had a grey tinge to them. You definitely want to talk about something secret, Endeavor grunted. Not even villains would spend time in a place so boring. All Might chuckled. That's kind of the point. Between this location and my condition, he gestured to his skinny body. Well, I wouldn't have to worry about people trying to listen in on these conversations. Endeavor's interest was piqued, despite himself. All Might wasn't normally so. Clandestine. What sort of conversations? All Might led him to the far wall and placed his hand over a seemingly random tile. There was a pulse of light as it scanned his handprint, and then a secret door slid open. You're about to be named the new top hero in Japan, All Might said, ignoring Endeavor's question. As such, you'll be entrusted with this country's safety. That's a lot of weight for one person. I can handle it, Endeavor growled. I'm sure you can, but I learned the hard way that there should be something to fall back on. All Might led him into an elevator, which started moving down. When I fought all for one six years ago, I was convinced that I had to face him alone. I was. I was buying into my own hype, and it made me arrogant. If I had had help from heroes just as good as me, that fight would have been over much faster. He paused, lost in thought, then shook himself out of his memories. After that fight, Nezu and I talked about a potential resource that Japan has been ignoring for years. This was the result of that. Endeavor tensed as he entered a relatively small room, adorned only with seven machines shaped like rings, just large enough for someone of Endeavor's size to comfortably stand in. These are experimental, All Might said. Nezu created them. Think of them like hologram projectors, combined with a video phone. You can speak to anyone in the system, as long as they're standing in a similar machine. Only 13 people in the entire world even know this exists, and even fewer have access to it. You make number 14. Endeavor frowned. I think Nezu has been watching too much science fiction. I think he was inspired by Star Trek. All Might admitted, but it works. Why don't I introduce you? He stepped into the ring closest to the door as soon as he was completely inside. The center was illuminated by blue light. Authorization, All Might, conference mode. Authorization granted, a synthesized voice said. Four guests waiting in lobby. Only four. All Might muttered. I was hoping everyone could be here for this. Four of the rings glowed like All Might's did, and four holograms flickered into view. Endeavor raised an eyebrow. He knew these people, these heroes, and had been aware of their exploits for years. All of them were the top heroes of their respective countries, and one of them had been so for almost 30 years. Gentleman Jack of the United Kingdom, an older man, with a white mustache, and a thinning hairline concealed by a bowler hat. His brown suit, Union Jack-themed tie and gold-topped cane suggested an aging businessman, not a pro-hero, but his quirk made him almost unstoppable. It was called Double Reflection. He used it to copy the abilities of anyone he could see at double the power, and he could use it on up to three people at once. It wasn't just quirks he could copy. Either Endeavor had read a report of Jack stopping a computer virus by copying a programmer's skills and then being twice as good at it. Panzer was the top hero of Germany and looked the complete opposite of Jack. He was even bigger than Endeavor, bursting with muscle that was barely contained by a simple white shirt and black military pants with matching boots. His face was hidden by what looked like the front half of a tank, minus the barrel of the turret. His quirk, called Machinist, allowed him to turn any part of his body into any machine, provided he knew how it worked. He could chase down fleeing criminals by turning his entire body into a Formula One race car, 
or fly through the air as a helicopter. During serious fights, he preferred to turn his arms into various weapons that would normally be mounted on armored vehicles. Endeavor had a grudging respect for Panzer. A year ago, he had single-handedly brought down an entire arms smuggling organization without ever stopping and had then continued on to intercepting a stolen armored car 15 minutes later. Maccabee was a bit of a mystery. The Israeli government wanted as few people to know about their top hero as possible, though that was their mo for most of their heroes. He wore an olive green uniform similar to those used by the IDF, accented with lightning bolts stitched into his shoulders. His face was concealed by a featureless white mask, and Endeavor wondered how he could see. Not much was known about his quirk, only that it was called heroism. As far as anyone knew, the longer Maccabee fought, the stronger and more durable he became, and that strength extended to those he trusted. No one was sure what his upper limit was, or even if he had one. The last was Stars and Stripes, and Endeavor was reminded of why he disliked the American hero so much. Everything about her, from her costume to her hairstyle, was a tribute to All Might. It was like someone had taken All Might, turned him into a woman, and then an American flag threw up on her. Her quirk, New Order, was possibly the single scariest quirk Endeavor had ever heard of. As long as she was in physical contact with something and said its name, she could alter its properties in any way she wanted. There was probably some kind of limit, but the United States wasn't going to be advertising its greatest hero's weakness. Regardless, it was one of two quirks that Gentleman Jack had publicly admitted he couldn't copy, the other being All Might's quirk. Endeavor had never liked stars and stripes, it just felt like she was trying too hard to be All Might, without ever trying to be her own person. That, and she had a flawless record, making it to the top of the American charts only a few months after her debut. Master, stars and stripes smiled broadly. It's so good to see you again. How have you been since that last fight? Recovering nicely. All Might smiled. I'm getting there, Stripes, but I still had to retire. And you don't have to call me Master anymore. Stars and Stripes shook her head. You'll always be my inspiration though I suppose I could call you Sir. Just call me All Might, if you can't bring yourself to use my real name. All Might shrugged. Calling me Sir will just make me think you're talking to Night Eye. Gentleman Jack scoffed. The lad shouldn't have added Sir to his name. I don't recall him ever being granted a peerage. You need to let that go, Panzer said with a booming laugh. You've been going on about that for years. He's right, I can practically see you winding up for a rant, Maccabee added. Jack harumphed loudly, then reached for something out of view, and brought back a steaming cup of tea. Ah, there it is, Stripes teased. If he can't rant, he goes for the tea. Better I drink it than some yank tosses it into a harbor. How are you still salty about that? Your great-grandparents weren't even alive when that happened. Endeavor watched the byplay with some disbelief. He had been intrigued by the idea that top heroes had a secret communication system, and it made sense to do so if there was a crisis, but seeing them act so childishly was dumbfounding. Part of him also felt betrayed by All Might. Japan had long held a belief that its heroes were superior to those of other countries. It was why they rarely offered to join any multinational hero teams, or why they didn't send representatives to any international conferences relating to heroes. As far as the Japanese were concerned, their heroes were the shining examples all others should follow. Endeavor wondered how some people might react if they knew that All Might was secretly communicating with foreign heroes. Before we get down to business, I have a question. All Might gestured to the three dark rings. Where are the others? Geosync is dealing with a massive oil spill off the coast, Maccabee said, referring to Russia's top hero. She wanted to keep it from reaching Japanese waters. She sends you her love, All Might. Panzer burst out laughing again. I can't believe she's still pining after you. She's, what, only 20? 22, All Might admitted, and Endeavor had the pleasure of seeing his former rival look decidedly embarrassed. At least she's not sending me poems anymore. Monkey King sends his regards as well, but he wouldn't say why he couldn't make it, Stripe said. That, at least, Endeavor understood. China's top hero was notorious for never being where people wanted, yet always being where he needed to be. And what about Ranger? All Might paused, and all eyes turned to Jack. The British hero slowly and deliberately put his tea aside, and then wrapped his can against the floor. That criminal said he was busy. Stripes rolled her eyes. Gentleman Jack usually lived up to his name, but he had a deep-seated hatred for anything regarding Australia, including its top hero. He told me he was visiting his mother. Her cancer is getting worse. All Might winced. I'll send him my best wishes after we're done here. He coughed, and quickly wiped away a dribble of blood. I was hoping everyone would be here, but this will do. I'd like to introduce my replacement to our ranks. Endeavor recognized his cue, and stepped into the ring that All Might vacated. 
Greetings, everyone. I am Endeavor. Gentleman Jack smiled genially. You finally made it to the top, did you? Congratulations. Maccabee snapped a formal salute. Glad to have you with us, sir. Don't go saluting him yet, we might hate him. Panzer laughed. I mean, probably not, after all, you put up with me, right? Stars and Stripes looked him up and down, then crossed her arms. We'll see how you do. Endeavor mirrored her. He knew she held All Might up to a standard that was impossible to match, so he wouldn't even try to please the American. Think what you want, he said. I plan to let my deeds do the talking. Tell me, why did you all agree to this club? Jack chuckled. Oh, that was Nezu's idea, though he stopped attending these meetings a while ago. It's not boastful to say that the eight of us represent some of the most powerful heroes on the planet. Every decision we make can have world-altering consequences. Look at All Might. He reduced crime in Japan to a fraction of what it was. We have a responsibility to stay in contact with each other. We made a pact to assist each other if a crisis arises that is too difficult for any one of us to deal with. This includes breaking international law regarding heroes crossing borders, Maccabee added. It's very much a case of asking forgiveness instead of permission. Sometimes, we don't have the luxury of letting the wheels of bureaucracy turn at their own pace, Stripe said. It hasn't been necessary, thank God, but it's a good contingency. Panzer nodded. All Might isn't the first to bring in a replacement. Geosync took Red Bear's spot when that old beast retired, and Ranger was given an entirely new spot two years ago. He pointed at Jack when the old man opened his mouth. I don't want to hear it. You got outvoted. So, other than emergencies, what else would we use this system for? Endeavor asked. Surely not for social calls. We decided to have short meetings three times a year, Maccabee explained. Just to give each other updates on anything big that might have happened, but didn't require backup. That business with All for One, for example, would have been brought up by All Might. Speaking of which, have there been any updates about that? What was it called? League of Villains. Panzer leaned forward. That nine bastard is wanted in three countries, mine included. They made a move yesterday, Endeavor said, after a moment's consideration. Two heroes were killed, and nearly thirty police officers were injured. Son of a, Stripes bit her lip to keep from finishing that curse. Sorry to hear that. You should know, our governments are keeping an eye on things in Japan. Endeavor tensed. Are they planning an intervention? More like they'll offer support if things get worse, but if it's refused. Stripes trailed off. A forced intervention is possible, Gentleman Jack said gravely. Perhaps even an occupation, until the situation is resolved. Endeavor had to resist the urge to let his quirk flare up. He couldn't allow such a thing to happen. Not just because it would forever tarnish his reputation, but because it deeply offended his pride as a Japanese citizen. I swear, it will not reach that point, Endeavor promised. If nothing else, that is incentive to keep me at the top of my game. That's a relief, Maccabee said. Just remember, don't let anything said during these meetings get out. They're not endorsed by any government, we're just colleagues having a private conversation. Endeavor nodded. It wouldn't do to cause widespread panic and outrage over what was, for now, entirely hypothetical. All Might, who had been silent for a while now, clapped his hands. Well, it seems you're all getting along now. I suppose I'll take my leave. You can introduce Endeavor to Ranger, Geosync and Monkey King during the next meeting. You don't have to leave. Stripes whined. Just because you're retired doesn't mean you can't still be a part of this group. All Might asked Endeavor a silent question, and the new top hero stepped aside for a moment. All Might stepped into the ring to let Stripes look him in the eyes. I'm sorry, but that's exactly what it means. I'm not an active hero anymore, and only active top heroes can join. That's why Red Bear doesn't join us anymore. But, since no one could see him now, Endeavor didn't hold back a facepalm when Stripes actually teared up. What will you do now? I'm a teacher at UA, All Might reminded her. And I've got a few things to take care of before my condition gets to the point of no return. That got Endeavor's attention. He knew All Might had been hurt badly enough to retire, and should have retired after his first fight with All for One. But finding out he was getting worse was new to him. I came here today to bring Endeavor into the loop, All Might continued. I would like you all to treat him with the same respect you gave me. If you need to speak to me, you'll have to go through official channels from now on. He glanced at his replacement and nodded. Now, if you'll excuse me. The other heroes nodded back, or, in Maccabee's case, saluted and let All Might step out of the ring once more. I'll have your fingerprints entered into the security system before we leave, he whispered to Endeavor. You should stay for a little longer, get to know these guys. I'll wait upstairs until you're done. Very well. Endeavor paused, then stopped All Might from leaving with a gentle, for him hand on the skinny man's shoulder. All Might, thank you for entrusting me with this. I know that you and I have never gotten along, but I will not let this go to waste. All Might just smiled and left. 
Once he was gone, Endeavor stepped back onto the projector. All right, is there anything else I should know? Midoriya had faced quite a lot over the last few months, but for some reason, his last day in Night Eye's agency had him nervous. Tagata wasn't with him in the office, and Night Eye sat behind his desk, not looking up from his computer. Finally, he could take the silence no longer. Um, sir, what are you doing? Organizing efforts between various agencies and the police to stamp out the last trigger facilities, Night Eye said promptly. Tisaki may not be here to create more, but there are still reserves in play. I would rather not let it fall into the hands of someone with the ability to recreate the formula. Oh, that makes sense. For some reason, Midoriya had thought that Trigger would just magically disappear without Chisaki, but he realized that he'd been naive. I am also handling your discharge papers. Night I printed up several sheets of paper, signed them, and then stapled them together. This shows that you completed your work study under me and it will also be entered into your professional record when you become a full-fledged hero. If this is how you are starting your career, I expect great things from you. Midoriya blinked and accepted the paperwork. TH thank you. I won't let you down. One more thing. Night I slid an envelope across his desk. Your pay for this month's work. Upon review of your performance during the Eight Precepts raid and the danger you faced, you were authorized to receive a bonus. Midoriya opened the envelope and stared at the check. At first, he thought someone had accidentally added in an extra zero. There was enough money there to pay for his parents' rent five times over, with enough left to eat at a nice restaurant every day for a week. Now I know why so many heroes are rich, he blurted out. Heroes are expected to face the most dangerous enemies and react to the most extreme of emergencies. Night I allowed the tiniest of smirks. The government isn't about to let such valuable assets go unrewarded. Midoriya swallowed nervously. He suddenly wondered if all this money was why so many heroes had been deemed corrupt by Stain. It was possible that some of them really were in it for fame and fortune. I won't let that be me, he swore. I'm not going to prove Stain right about heroes. One more thing, Night I said. I am aware that your first internship was with Hawks and that you respect him a great deal. I am sure that you would prefer an internship with him over me in the future. He held up a hand to stop Midoriya from protesting. I am not offended. Still, if he is unavailable, my door will always be open, either for future internships or simply for advice. Midoriya processed that and realized just what Night Eye could offer him. He bowed deeply. Thank you very much, Sir Night Eye. I will take you up on your offer. Night Eye nodded. You are welcome. Now, you are dismissed, Midoriya-san, you have a train to catch. As soon as Midoriya was gone, Night Eye took out his phone and dialed a number. Yes, after careful consideration, I have decided to withdraw any suspicions regarding Midoriya-san, Night Eye said evenly. His motives are pure, his drive is righteous, and once he masters his abilities, I believe he will become one of the greatest heroes in the entire world. That is possibly the highest praise I have ever heard from you. Does that mean you will continue to spy on him during training? No, I do not believe that is necessary. Midoriya-san and Mirio will only push each other to greater heights, with no help from me. Then I suppose All Might is the last to convince. Night I frowned. He still suspects Midoriya-san of being connected to All for One. I thought we had agreed that he had just been trying to get under All Might's skin at Tartarus. I think he succeeded. He trusts my judgment, but he recently cleared some of his previous obligations, so he might start focusing on the boy. Can I count on your support, if it should come to that? Night I considered that for a moment. He had only recently repaired his relationship with All Might, and opposing him might tear down that mended fence. Still, Midoriya had proved himself. You have my support, Nezu-san. Comet, Oljodsks. Dial, what? Comet, SSM keyed. Tape, is she okay? Frog, no, she's broken. She's been this way since we left Ruku's agency, Ribbit. Crayon, why is she broken? Book, she saw how much Ruku paid her. Comet, so much money. Dial, I got paid too. It was a lot. Book, really? I got more for my birthday from my parents. Tape, thank you for reminding us that you're richer than some countries, Momo. Glasses, I agree with Izuku and Achako, the pay was considerable. Snowflake, I had no idea Endeavor made this much. Actually, he makes a lot more since I got a sidekick salary. Now I know how we can afford to replace the home gym every time he burns it down. Dial, does that happen a lot? Snowflake, every time he gets angry, and he works out when he gets angry. So, yes, Comet, I'm sending most of this to my parents. If I get a few more paychecks like this, I can send them on vacation like I promised. Dial, where do they want to go? 
Comet, Hawaii. I want to give them at least a week of doing nothing but relaxing on a beach with those coconut drinks with the little umbrellas. Tape, if I make this kind of cash, can I go with them? Frog, same, ribbit. Comet, no, get your own island getaway. Tape, so, Tahiti is open. Look, can we please focus for a moment? I want to check when you are all getting back to UA. Dial, 20 minutes. Mirio took the train before mine, so he should be at school by now. Glasses, Hanta and I will be there in approximately 30 minutes. Snowflake, maybe an hour. Endeavor's fans got in my way, and I missed the first train. Crayon, 10 minutes. They'll probably be asleep when you get here, I'm still turd after yesterday. Frog, Momo, Achako and I are on the same train with you. We're right in front of you. You don't need to ask when we will be back. Frog, I know I could have just said it out loud, but I thought everyone else would laugh. Frog, ribbit. Tape, I was laughing, and now I can feel my soul getting stabbed. Crayon, are dating her, so are clearly into that. Tape, no comment. Crayon, hey, I just thought of a something. Snowflake, should we be worried? Crayon, maybe. Midori, you were on the news, and Bakugo saw it. How mad is he gonna be? Dial, maybe you all should take cover. Comet, I'm not that worried. He has to go through me to get to you, Deku-kun. Book, that is both sweet and slightly frightening. Crayon, Awa. Frog, I almost want to see him try, if only to watch him get thrown into space. Glasses, it would certainly be quieter. Book, now all we need is to find a way to get rid of Maita. Tape, Guwad let the hate flow through you. Snowflake, I miss you guys. Dr. Garaki turned in his chair and smiled behind his bushy mustache. Well, Shigaraki, how have you been? Pretty good, Shigaraki admitted. Word spread about what I did to Chisaki, and now people know what I do to rivals. I've already received pledges of loyalty as well as money. We might not have what the Yakuza did, but we're growing in power. You're growing in influence, Garaki corrected. That's not the same as power, but it's a useful tool. I have my own power as well as Nine and Chimera. Your quirk is strong, but it has its limits. Garaki shrugged. You have allies like Nine and Chimera, but they have free will and can disobey you at any time. What you need is a weapon that can overpower any obstacle, and will be completely devoted to you. And do you have that? Shigaraki asked. A new Namu, maybe. I have several such creations, but no, that's not what I'm talking about. Garaki held out a manila folder. This is everything I have on one Gigantamacia. He was all for one's bodyguard, until he was sent away for his O protection, and he is loyal beyond belief. You may be all for one's successor, but Gigantamacia won't accept you because you claim the throne. You have to earn his loyalty, challenge him to a battle, and don't stop until he yields. It will take time months, maybe, but if you succeed, you'll not only have a powerful weapon, you'll be ready for the next stage of the project. Shigaraki quickly flipped through the file. It contained a list of Gigantamacia's different quirks, what they did, and a few other useful tidbits. Not enough to walk him through a fight, but enough to get him started on a plan. Fine, I'll do it if it means clearing the next level. Shigaraki turned to leave. Send Kirijiri the location and I'll go when I've prepared. Oh, and doctor. Yes, my boy. How is the project going? Did those blood samples help? Garaki grinned. Absolutely. The pieces are lining up nicely. I imagine it will be ready by the time you're done with Gigantamacia assuming you survive. To the rising star's surprise, Bakugo did not react with violence or even excessive profanity. Instead, he settled for doubling down on his studies and his training, intent on catching up as quickly as possible. That was perfectly fine for Midoriya, he was just happy to spend his days without plotting the downfall of a Yakuza boss. The next week after the work studies was mostly pleasant, even boring, but that was fine for most of the students. When they weren't doing homework or training, they were happy to have as little happen as possible. That changed the full week after the raid, when Midoriya was heading out of his room. He had just been about to head downstairs, when he received a text from Yeyarazu, telling him to come to her room as quickly as possible. It was terse, bordering on impolite, which was unlike her. Slightly alarmed, he headed for her room, where he found not just Yeyarazu, but the other girls of one as well. Worried as he was, he didn't quite register that all their clothes looked slightly rumpled. What's going Yuraraka quickly shushed him, and he continued at a whisper. What's going on? Jairo-chan heard something in the ventilation. Yeyarazu said, and Jairo waved one of her jacks with a grim expression. She said it sounded like an animal. I don't suppose you could turn into something that could get rid of it. Sure thing. Nidoriya vanished in a flash of green light, and when it faded, it was almost impossible to see him. Upon looking closer, the girl saw what looked like a tiny metal fairy, with a single green eye. I don't think you've seen Nanomech yet. The girls all had to stifle their giggles at Nanomech's adorably squeaky voice. No, I don't think we have, Yuraka said. Good luck in the vents, Deku-kun.
Nanomech spread his tiny wings and flew up to the vent above Yeyarazu's room. As soon as he was gone, Gyro plugged one of her jacks into the wall. Do you think we should have told him it was mine to? Hagakure asked. Ashida waved her hand dismissively. No, nah, he might decide to call Aizawa Sensei first. This way, Minta can suffer. Yuraraka shifted in place. I feel bad for lying to him. We didn't lie, Yeyarazu said primly. That little rat's panting did sound like an animal. SHH. Gyro held up one hand. I think I can hear them. What the heck? Midoriya, is that you? Minta, why are you in the vent? Actually, why do you have a camera in the vent connected to Momo's room? You know, there's a perfectly good explanation for hey. Oh, don't transform in front of me, you almost blinded me. What the heck is that gray frog? No, wait, give me back my camera. Minta, were you trying to take pictures of the girls in our class? I, uh, heard they were going to Yeyarazu's room to try on a bunch of clothes. Please don't hurt me. Too late. When Minta tumbled out of the vent, he had the beginnings of a black eye. He was slightly woozy, and didn't notice that he'd landed in front of the girls he'd been trying to spy on until Gyro lifted him up by the collar. Minta laughed weakly. Hi. Five minutes later, Aizawa arrived on the scene and found Minta beaten, tied up, and trying to keep Hagakure from kicking him in the groin again. Several other boys from the class, including Todoroki and Siro, were there to make sure the violence didn't escalate, though those with girlfriends looked ready to continue the beating. It took less than two minutes to explain the situation to Aizawa, and he was given the camera as evidence. Aizawa sighed. Okay, Minta, detention for the next two weeks. You're also forbidden from coming within ten feet of any female student outside of class-related activities until further notice. Two weeks of detention. Yeyurazu was outraged. Aizawa-sensei, what he did is grounds for expulsion. I want to agree with you, but Aizawa sighed and held up the camera. He didn't actually take any pictures. It looks like he was stopped before he could do that, which means there's grounds for reasonable doubt as to his intentions. I think it's stupid, but that's what anyone appealing the expulsion will use, and it'll work. He glared at Minta, who whimpered. However, if he tries something like this again, and he's stopped in time, I might look the other way if you decide to inflict this punishment again. He sighed again. Now, please untie him so that I can take him to recovery girl, and then detention. To the surprise of everyone, it was Midoriya who moved first, rather than untie Minta. He lifted him up by the ear. Try this again, and I won't hit you as gray matter, he said. Next time, I'll use Raph. Aizawa raised an eyebrow. Midoriya had had the courage to make that threat in front of a teacher. Moreover, that threat had been made in a perfectly even tone, something he had to have picked up from Nidai. When Aizawa and Minta were gone, and the small crowd dispersed, Yuraraka gave her boyfriend a kiss. Thanks for being so noble, she said. Screw that. Ashido grabbed him and kissed him on the cheek. That's for letting us beat him up. Yeyurazu hesitated, then shrugged and also kissed Midoriya on the cheek. I can't disagree. Midoriya was too stunned to react, and the other three girls gave him a quick kiss as well. It was barely a peck, much faster than Yuraraka's kiss, but it was still enough to leave him almost catatonic. On any other day, I think some of us might be jealous, Siro joked, but I think you earned that, dude. Don't worry, Ribbit, Asui said as she took Siro's hand. I like you more. Good, Yuraraka said, hugging Midoriya tightly and glaring at the other girls. I'd hate to send you into space. At that point, Midoriya's brain decided to completely stop working, and he passed out. Todoroki cautiously poked him, then looked at Ishido. Was all that worth it? His girlfriend grinned and held up her phone. She had taken more than a few pictures of her own during Minta's beating. Oh, definitely. The first round is just me, Shigaraki said. No one else interferes during the first fight. I want to prove to him that I can stand on my own before I show that I can lead. Twice shifted nervously. You sure you don't want me to mix in some clones to let you rest? Yeah, I'm sure. This isn't just proving to Gigantamacia that I'm ready, I'm proving it to myself. Okay, but just remember that we're here if you need us. Twice jabbed a thumb into his chest. You brought me into the league, gave me people I care about. Whatever you decide, I'll back you. Shigaraki was genuinely touched by the open display of loyalty, but didn't let it show. All right, I'm off. While Gigantamacia's location was hidden, once you knew where to look, it wasn't hard to find. Hiding a 20-foot-tall monster was far from easy. The first word that came to Shigaraki's mind when he saw Gigantamacia was big. He wasn't the largest being he'd ever met, but beyond just his physical size, there was an enormous aura that surrounded him that promised death should he be disturbed. The second word that came to mind was spiky. The giant's head, hands and back were covered in dull spikes, and the rest of his skin just seemed too angular, like it was halfway to becoming natural armor. Even his hair was spiky. Gigantamacia, Shigaraki called out as he made his way into the giant's sanctuary. 
I've come to challenge you. Gigantamacia stirred and slowly turned to face him. Why should I fight you? Shigaraki grinned. Because I'll kill you if you don't. I have no use for a weapon that won't fight. HRN. Gigantamacia sneered. Then why would I be your weapon? First, I'm the successor to your master, all for one. Shigaraki held his arms out. And even if I wasn't, I'm going to create a world where someone like you doesn't have to hide. But I need your power to make it happen. You say your master's successor. Gigantamacia reared up. And in Shigaraki's mind, it almost seemed like he grew bigger. No, I don't believe you. Master would never choose a weakling like you. Oh, I'm far from weak. Shigaraki crouched and brought his hands up, ready to pounce. Let me show you. The two monsters, one in body and power, the other in spirit and deed, charged at each other. Bakugo slammed his hand on the table, making both Midoriya and Ishido jump and look up from their homework. In your fucking face, Deku, Bakugo snapped and drew his hand back, revealing the provisional license he'd earned. Now, I've caught up to you. Ashido leaned over to look at the license. The picture of Bakugo had an arrogant sneer that annoyed her. Actually, you're still behind, she said, before she could help herself. Midori finished a work study, and you didn't. The only way you can catch up is if you do a work study, and he doesn't do another. Shut up, raccoon eyes, Bakugo snarled. This is between me and Deku. She's right, though, Midoriya pointed out. And I don't want to miss the next work study. Ashido grinned triumphantly. That means Midori is still gonna be ahead of you. Bakugo just scowled. We both have provisional licenses, so we're both on the same level. After he stormed off, Midoriya buried his head in his hands. Why do you have to antagonize him? You're just making it worse. Hey, if he keeps making a big deal about this, I'm gonna mess with him. And what happens if he snaps and tries to blow you up? Midoriya groaned again. If you're so determined that we're twins, can I at least not have my sister get blown up? Ashido waved him off. Hey, I'm sure you won't let him. Or Shoto won't let him. And even if he tries, I can take him. Midoriya gave her a flat look. Really? Okay, maybe not, but I'll make it really hard for him. Ashido leaned back in her chair. Besides, I think we proved that nobody messes with our family and gets away with it. She glanced over Midoriya's shoulder and grinned. Speaking of family, Midoriya followed her gaze and smiled when he saw Yuraraka walk into the room with Iri. After that first night, Iri hadn't asked to sleep with both of them, and now seemed content with switching between them every other night. That was fine with the two teenagers, that night had, upon reflection by both of them, been far beyond what they were comfortable with. That didn't stop them from cuddling more than they used to, even without Iri. I think we need a break, Ashido declared, and put her homework away. I'll grab some snacks for us. Thanks, Midoriya said, and got up to meet his girlfriend. H. Hey, Achako. Hey, Iri-chan. Izu. Iri hugged his leg and smiled up at him, something that continued to brighten the hearts of any who saw it. Yuraraka gave him a quick kiss. I saw Bakugo a minute ago. Is everything okay? Midoriya shrugged helplessly. Mina got under his skin. She really has it out for him. I don't blame her. He's a real Yuraraka glanced down at Iri, who was following their conversation, and amended what she'd been about to say. Jerk. He's a real jerk. At least he behaves around Iri, because he knows that everyone else in the class will kill him if he doesn't, they both fought. Even Minda had given Bakugo a warning look the other day, which had taken him a step in the right direction of getting back into the girl's good graces. Moving away from that topic, Yuraraka said, Did you and Momo tally up the suggestions for the school festival? Midoriya nodded. During homeroom the day before, Aizawa had announced that Yue was hosting a school festival, in which every class would host an event. There would also be events created by the staff, along with stands for food and hero merchandise. The school would allow the families of the students to enter the campus, giving everyone some much-needed time with their loved ones. We sorted the votes this morning, he said. Looks like we're putting on a concert. Oh, cool. Yuraraka saw Ashido returning to the table with an armful of snacks and waved. I guess Mina decided to teach us all how to dance. Not everyone, Midoriya said. Some of the class has to help with the backstage stuff, so it'll probably be the ones who don't want to do the performing. Yeah, I can't really see Shoto or Takoyami dancing and singing. Yuraraka giggled at the mental image. Chako, Iri tugged at Yuraraka's hand. What's a concert? Yuraraka scooped the little girl into her arms. It's a show where people dance and sing in front of other people. Oh, Iri was quiet for a moment. What's dancing and singing? With a jolt of horror, Midoriya and Yuraraka realized that Iri had never been exposed to music before. You'll find out soon, Midoriya promised. I bet this will be the best concert ever. In Ko sighed as she dusted the shelves. The apartment had already felt empty without her husband, and it was even more so with Izuku in the dorms. Sometimes, she felt completely alone, 
and that only her work and her phone calls with Hisashi and her son kept her sane. She had become so used to the silence in her home that when the phone rang, she jumped. She fumbled with the phone for a moment, and then brought it to her ear. Hello, Midoriya Residence, Midoriya and Co. The voice on the other end of the line cheerful, refined, and confident. My name is Yatsubashi Rikia. And Co nearly dropped her phone. Yatsubashi was the CEO of Detnarat, one of the most successful businesses in Japan. He was also the man who quite clearly held Hisashi's fate in his hands, and Inko knew it. Why Yatsubashi-san, this is unexpected. How can I help you? Yatsubashi chuckled ruefully. Ah, oh, how I wish my employees' families didn't always sound so nervous. Let me assure you, I'm not calling with bad news. The first thing I wanted to mention was that I saw your son on the news, and I wanted to congratulate you. It fills me with pride that the son of one of my most valued employees played a key role in bringing down those Yakuza thugs, though I'm sure that pride is nothing compared to your own. Inko smiled. Yes, he's becoming a wonderful hero. I know that I mentioned this to Hisashi, but I would love it if your son considered letting my company sponsor him, even if it's just to help set up his agency when he's a pro. At the very least, I would dearly like to meet him in person. I'm something of a meta-enthusiast, and your son's ability is possibly the most fascinating I've ever seen. Oh, really? Actually, that's the kind of topic Izuku loves to talk about. She was a little thrown off by Yatsubashi's use of the term meta. It was an old term, one that had been used before they were renamed to quirks. Yatsubashi laughed. Another enthusiast like myself. I haven't even met the boy, and I already like him. He paused, as if listening to someone else. Ah, uh, my apologies, I like to ramble sometimes. There was another reason why I'm calling, and it has to do with Hisashi. Why yes, after reviewing the work he's done for us for the last few years, we realized that he was gravely underappreciated. Someone of his talents should not have to be sent willy-nilly all over the world. He can be just as effective, if not more so, right here. Yatsubashi laughed again. He'll still have to work away from your home, I'm sorry to say, but I've made sure that he'll be able to see you every weekend, and he'll have a substantial increase in pay. Is that acceptable? Inko didn't realize she'd lost strength in her legs until her knees hit the floor. She hurriedly wiped the tears from her face. Why yes, thank you so much, Yatsubashi-san. Izuku will also be delighted. I'm glad to hear it. There was a slapping sound, suggesting that Yatsubashi had clapped his hands together. Isashi would have called you, but he's been delayed by some last-minute work in London. Consider my call to you on his behalf an apology. That is, Inko was about to say unnecessary, but decided against it. That is very much appreciated, Yatsubashi-san. Good. Now, I'll leave you to tell your son the good news. Have a wonderful day, ma'am. Inko stared at the phone for a long time after Yatsubashi hung up. When she finally got back to her feet, she realized she was grinning wildly. Isashi was coming home. Are you sure we should do this, gentle? Going after Yue seems kind of risky, and there are lots of kids there. Not to worry, Le Brava, I have no intention of causing harm to any children. This will only be to make a statement, a grand performance. I trust you, gentle, but the teachers might come after you, and some of the kids might get caught in the crossfire. And that, dear La Brava, is why our plan must be as thorough and meticulous as possible. Are you with me? Always and forever, gentle, you know that. Your loyalty is an inspiration all its own, my dear. Come, let us plan our invasion. For all that her friends loved her, none of them would deny that Ashido could be an absolute drill sergeant when she wanted to be, especially when it came to her favorite hobby. Achako, lift those arms higher. Tenya, keep your arms loose, or so help me, I will break your arms and make them loose. Ashido leveled a glare that would have impressed Aizawa. Mainta, if you put one toe out of your assigned area, I will melt you into a puddle. Mainta saluted. Why yes, ma'am. Mainta was just glad that he was allowed to participate in the concert. That, and he was glad that the girls in his class had stopped calling him the little rat, except Yeyorazu, who seemed to be trying to get his name changed to that moniker. Some of the class had tried to be part of the actual dance routine, and many of them had auditioned. Ashido, the resident expert on dance, had watched each attempt, and had the final say on who was good enough to learn a routine in only a week. Some, like Siro and Kirishima, had the enthusiasm, but not the correct moves for what Ashido had planned. They would join others, like Todoroki and Koda, backstage, helping with some of the lights, sounds, and everything else that helped make a successful concert. Not all the class was working the stage or dancing. Like Ishido, Jiro had scoured the class for the best musicians, and had immediately claimed them for the band section. That included Kaminari, Takoyami, Yeyurazu, and, to everyone's shock, Bakugo. Even more surprising, he accepted with almost no grumbling. 
if we're gonna do this shit. He had said as he sat down at the drums to practice, we're gonna do this so well that the whole damn school is gonna die. For his part, Midoriya had been deemed good enough to dance, but not good enough for the center stage. He was fine with that, the dancing was fun, when he wasn't getting yelled at by Ashido, and he'd had more than enough attention lately. Ashido looked at her watch. Okay, that's it for now. One hour to rest or whatever. Then we do it again. Only I want it done better. Midoriya sat down and stretched his sore arms. Ashido had lectured him to speed up his arm movements, and now he was paying the price for his enthusiasm. Need some ice? Todoroki asked as he walked by, carrying a piece of the stage they were building. No, I'll be fine, Midoriya assured him. Mina is just working us really hard. Minta coughed. I want to make a joke about Ashida working Todoroki hard, but I honestly think she'll kill me. Todoroki leveled an impassive stare at Minta that managed to convey quite a bit of implied bodily harm. It's not her you need to worry about, rat. I thought we were past that, and I thought you were done being a sentient pile of pawn scum. Midoriya was too tired to let this continue. Besides, Minta had been behaving himself since the incident in the ventilation shaft. I'll take care of this, Shoto. You'd better get back to work before Mina sees you. Good point. Todoroki gave mine to another side eye, and then left. Thanks, Midoriya, Minta said. I just don't have the energy to deal with this right now. Midoriya gave him a look. Besides, if you do something, you'll get expelled. I know, I know. Minta sighed. I went too far. I'm sorry. The two sat in semi-companionable silence for a moment. So, how are things with you and Hiroraka? He held up his hands when Midoriya narrowed his eyes. I'm just asking, I swear. We are. Good, Midoriya said cautiously. Of all people, he wasn't expecting to discuss his relationship with his girlfriend with Maita. We're planning a date after the festival. How do you do it? Maita asked. You're high school students, you're trying to be pro heroes, and you're taking care of Eri. How do you have time to date? We don't, not often. Midoriya thought about it and realized something. I think we've only had three or four actual dates. Otherwise, we just spend a lot of time together. Minta shook his head. Honestly, I don't know how you two stayed in the hero course. After what happened at the summer camp, I kinda thought you would both drop out. He shifted uncomfortably. I almost did after the USJ attack. Really, Midoriya hadn't known that. But then he remembered how badly Minta had freaked out. Why didn't you? I guess I guess I was inspired by you and Asui. You both did what needed to be done, even though you were scared. I thought I could do that, too. Midoriya sighed. Minta was opening up his heart to him, so he threw him a bone. Well, you're still here, right? Maybe you're on the right path. Minta nodded shakily. Yeah, maybe I am. Now, if only you'd stop being such a pervert, maybe more people would like you. Hey, I mind to trailed off and looked uncomfortable. Okay, you're probably right. Maybe I should just keep that kind of stuff to myself. Please do, Ciro said dryly as he passed by. We'd all be able to get so much more done if we didn't have to keep an eye on you. Hey, mind to glared at him, but then paled. Crap, Ashido is coming back. Quick, Midoriya, try to look busy. Midoriya sighed, and when he saw Ashido's glare aimed at Maita, he managed to use only his eyes to convey the message that he was fine and that he would keep an eye on him. Ashido hesitated, then nodded, and went off to find something else to do. Enjoy the break while it lasts, he said. It's going to be a long few days. Sir Nighteye, you have a visitor. Nighteye glanced up from his computer. Is it important? I am still dealing with paperwork for the Eight Precepts raid. Centipter bowed. My apologies, but Hawks is here. He was insistent that he speak with you. Nighteye was rarely intrigued, but this was an exception. He had never spoken to the de facto, and soon to be official, if the rumors were anything to go by, number two hero in Japan before. He nodded, and Centipter withdrew. A moment later, the door opened wide enough to let Hawk's wings through. Hey, Night Eye, nice agency you got here. A little more down to earth than what I'm used to, but that seems like your style. He looked around the office. Wow, you've got a lot of All Might merch, huh? Personally, I'm more of an Endeavor fan, but whatever. Suddenly, Night Eye was aware of why Nezu sometimes complained about Hawks. Ten seconds in, and he was already tired of Hawks' chatter. Is there something you needed, Hawks? Night Eye tapped the edge of his computer's screen for emphasis. I am quite busy. Yeah, that stuff with those Yakuza, right. Man, that was wild, but at least you got it sorted out. Hawks sat down in front of the desk. I saw him on the news, but how did Midoriya do? He was my intern first, after all. Night I didn't even blink. You know as well as I that I can't discuss the particulars of the case until it's officially closed. Hawks rolled his eyes. Okay, how about unofficially? Come on, just between friends. We have never spoken before now. I would hardly call us friends. Night I frowned when he saw some of Hawks' feathers detach and float around. 
Is that really necessary? Sorry, force of habit. Hawk's easygoing smile dropped as several of his feathers crossed each other and Night Eye saw black marks on them. Marks that, when overlapped correctly, formed a message. It was gone as quickly as it appeared, but Night Eye knew what he saw. Help me, whatever was going on. Night Eye realized that Hawks couldn't say anything out loud. His curiosity and concern peaked. Night Eye played along. Oh, very well. Midoriya San performed beyond my expectations. His skills are far above what I would expect from a first year student. That's my boy. I knew he'd do well. Hawks grinned proudly and falsely, even as more feathers flitted around and formed more messages. On undercover mission, found something big. Need someone I can trust. Don't bring to HPSC. Night I heard the slightest squeak and saw a dry erase marker held by other feathers, hidden under one wing. He was using the marker to write out the puzzle piece message on multiple feathers, then wipe it clean and start again, all without actually looking at what he was doing. The level of control required was staggering, and if Night Eye hadn't been so concerned, he would have openly applauded such talent. I'm sure that I can discuss more as long as it doesn't directly apply to the case, he said, hoping that Hawks would get his own implied message. I'm listening. Cool, I'll get back to you on that. Hawks abruptly stood, but rather than immediately leave, he reached into his jacket. By the way, I found this interesting book a few weeks back. It was printed way back in the first generation of Quirks, and has a lot of interesting things to say. It's not often you get the perspective of those who lived in those times, right? He pulled out a book with a red cover and a black splotch that looked like a mask. It reminded Night Eye of something, but he couldn't remember what. I'll read it, Night Eye promised, positive that Hawks wouldn't have given him something if it wasn't important. Are there any sections of particular interest? Hawks grinned, and there was genuine relief in the expression. Actually, yeah. If you don't have time to go over the whole thing, I marked the parts I thought were really compelling. I'll be sure to go over those tonight, Night Eye said. However, we are both very busy. I am sure you have much to do. Yeah, I really do. Hawks waved as he walked out. See you later, Night Eye. We can fight over who gets Midoriya for his next internship next time. Night Eye only let out an exasperated sigh when the door fully closed. Even when sending secret messages, the man couldn't help but be infuriating. Putting aside thoughts of annoying peers, Night Eye turned his attention to his new reading material. If Hawks was worried enough to reach out for help, then it seemed that Night Eye had found his next long-term project. Construction of Class 1A's stage was significantly ahead of schedule. That was because the students were allowed to use their quirks if it helped in construction, and if a teacher was present to oversee the project. Since Aizawa couldn't be bothered, present Mike volunteered, though that could have been because Midoriya was using a small army of Echo Echo copies to do a lot of the manual labor. The man found that alien utterly fascinating. Hey, kid. The prime Echo Echo looked up at the teacher. Are you controlling all your copies, or what? Kind. Of. Echo Echo shrugged. It's not like. They are all. Puppets. It's more like. All of us. Are the same. Person. Huh. That must be trippy. Present Mike's ever-present grin widened when he saw Eri wave cutely at one Echo Echo, but seemed confused when another waved back. Melissa, who had volunteered to watch Eri for the day, thought it was absolutely adorable, and hugged the little girl tightly. Echo Echo waited until his copies had finished their work for the day, merged back with him, and then turned back to normal before speaking again. It's a little weird, Midoriya admitted. It's like I'm seeing the same thing from a bunch of slightly different angles. Present Mike went cross-eyed when he tried to imagine that. Nope, I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. You take a break, kid. I'll go see if Gyro-chan needs any musical input. Privately, Midoriya doubted that, though sound was Present Mike's thing. Gyro definitely had a better grasp of music. That was probably because, as the class had found out, both of Gyro's parents were talented musicians, and she had grown up playing more than a few instruments. Hey, Deku-kun. Midoriya turned and saw Yuraraka carrying a pile of metal bars several times larger than she was. Hi, Achako, what's up? Yuraraka shrugged, then left the metal floating in the air for a moment, and leaned in to give him a quick kiss. Just wanted to say hi. I saw Iri-chan on the way here. She said it was funny when you turn into something smaller than her. Maybe I should turn into grey matter and make funny faces, Midori amused as he accompanied his girlfriend. She's smiling, maybe we should see if we can get her to laugh. One step at a time, Yuraraka cautioned, then lowered the pile of metal to the ground and cancelled her quirk. We shouldn't rush her. I know, you're right. Yuraraka raised an eyebrow imperiously, in a passable imitation of Yeyurazu when she was annoyed. 
of course I'm right. The two tried to maintain their composure, but then started to giggle. Iraraka put one arm around Midoriya's waist and leaned her head on his shoulder. This is nice, she said. No fighting villains, no danger, just school life. I like this. Midoriya put one arm around her shoulders. That reminds me of something Hawks wanted to do. What? Go back to school. No, he wanted to create a world where heroes have nothing but free time on their hands. If we make that kind of world, we can relax like this all the time. There was an explosion in the distance, followed by a stream of cursing, and Uraraka snorted. Yeah, only interrupted by Bakugo. At least Uri isn't around to hear him, Midori aside. I still have some time before my break is over. Do you want to go for a walk or something? Uraraka smiled, then patted him on the back with her left hand. They both laughed when Midoriya started to float. Uraraka then gently pulled him back down and cancelled her quirk. Yeah, I'd like that. Nezu read through yet another stack of paperwork, and was struck by a curious combination of excitement and regret. On the one hand, he had never needed to consider so much security for UA even a year ago, and that felt like a knife in his heart. On the other hand, most of the heroes being brought in for that security were former students of his, and it was a rare opportunity for him to see so many at once. I hope Ingenium doesn't feel put upon to join us, he muttered to himself as he approved Ingenium's application. Then again, maybe he doesn't feel that we can protect his brother. Nezu doubted that. Ida Tensei had never so much as hinted that he was dissatisfied with UAS recent actions. In fact, while there were plenty of detractors throughout Japan, the hero community had been united in its support of UA and other hero schools. Part of this was because the heroes had to look united. The public would panic if their protectors fell into discord. Still, despite the number of heroes helping to secure the campus, Nezu was never one to put all his eggs in one basket. He sent a quick text message to Midoriya, asking him for a favor. He doubted that it would be necessary, but better safe than sorry. Besides, he said to himself, I think I would enjoy speaking to them again. So, just to be sure, you're not actually in trouble. Ben asked, your principal just wants some extra hands, right? Midoriya said. He also asked that you don't come in costume, you'd just be visiting family members. If you come, I mean, I'll talk to Kara and the kids, Ben said. I can't promise anything, though, Kara is helping her cousin keep some satellites from falling out of orbit for the next few days, Ken is running operations with the Titans, and Jen is studying for college midterms. What are you doing? There was a pause, followed by a rueful chuckle. I've gotta stay home for a day or two. Kara and I got so focused on work that we're late on some bills. I need to pay those so that we still have electricity. Oh, eh, sorry, not your fault. I've been doing this for almost 40 years, and I still sometimes have trouble balancing normal life and superhero work. Take my advice, kid, unless there's a crisis, always give yourself at least one day out of the week to decompress, or you'll burn out. Midoriya filed that away as the good advice that it was. So, should I tell Nezu-sensei that you're a maybe? Ben sighed. A, put us all down as a probably. Jen will want to see you, and Kara and Ken could use a break. If we don't show, we'll send you our best, okay? Thanks. Midoriya looked at the time. Oh, I need to go, my class is doing another rehearsal soon, and then we have homework. The one thing I don't miss about being your age, Ben joked. That, and all the angst. Talk to you later, kid. Midoriya hung up and hurried downstairs, where many of his classmates were crowded in a circle, holding packages with excited smiles. Deku-kun, Uraraka dashed over to him and thrust another package into his arms. Momo made uniforms for everyone performing. Midoriya opened the box and saw a pair of yellow pants and a jacket, along with a red tie identical to the ones most of the class had stopped using for their school uniforms. Yeyurazu smiled and held up an orange shirt with Klasa printed on it. According to the rules of the festival, we all have to be wearing at least one part of our school uniforms during an official event. Those of you performing will have the ties, while the rest of us will wear these shirts instead of our complete uniforms. Ashido pulled a yellow skirt out and tugged at it experimentally. Sturdy, but flexible, and it won't get out of the way of any complicated steps. Momo, you're a total genius. Uraraka was already heading for the stairs. We should all try these on, just to make sure they fit. Most of the class headed out, but Yeyurazu noticed that Maita was lingering, trying to get her attention. Much to her surprise, he remained on the other side of the room and wasn't leering at her. Hey, Yeyurazu. Maita held up his own uniform. Thanks for this. Yeyurazu's expression was carefully neutral. As part of the performance, you're required to have a matching uniform. I did what was necessary for our class to participate. Maita nodded. It was clear that he was disappointed, but took what he could get. Sure, I'll, I'm gonna go make sure it fits. You probably didn't take my measurements, right? Yeyurazu raised an eyebrow. 
I can gauge someone's height and weight fairly easily. Besides, I calculated your measurements a long time ago. You did. Why? In case I ever got the chance to launch you out of a catapult. I wanted to ensure the maximum velocity and distance. Though, so, mine to paled. Um, just out of curiosity, how far would I have gone? Yeyarazu's smirk made his blood run cold. Far enough that I would have to come up with a plausible alibi if I were to be questioned by the authorities. Minta decided that it would be better if he stopped asking questions and darted upstairs. The day of the festival was easily the noisiest UA had ever been for Midoriya, barring the sports festival and the USJ attack. It seemed like every spare inch of the campus was being used for something, whether it was a refreshment stand, merchandise, or larger spots for games and performances. There was some grumbling among the other classes that one got the biggest allocation of space, but considering they were performing a concert that could house about a thousand people in the audience, it quickly passed. For Midoriya, he was more than a little nervous when he found out just how many people would be watching him. Sure, he wasn't the main focus of the performance, but he would still be there. Since he wasn't the star of the show, it wasn't quite as nerve-wracking. Somewhere between the opening moments of the USJ attack and going on his first date with Uraraka. How much longer until we're on, Ribbit? Asui asked. Midoriya glanced at his phone. Two hours. Should we get into costume yet? You guys don't have to until the last minute, Ashido half-joked, but parts of our costumes take a while to put on. They're a little tight. Midoriya tried not to blush. The girls' costumes for the performance consisted of very form-fitting purple bodysuits, along with yellow skirts and jackets. When he first saw Uraraka in hers, they were both so embarrassed that they couldn't look at each other for a full day. Oh, crap. Siro's words nearly made those who heard him panic. Hey, guys, the rope we're using to hold up Ayama broke. Can we get Momo to make some more? She and the rest of the band are doing some last-second practice, Ashido said. Do you want to interrupt Gyro's music sessions? Not really, I like having my eardrums the way they are. Siro sighed. I guess I could use my tape, but he could get tangled up. There's a general store just outside UA, Midoriya suggested. I could see if they have any rope, and if they don't, we could risk asking Momo. Asui tapped her chin. Can you get permission to go off campus, Ribbit? I think so. The heroes running security checked for 10 blocks outside the school, so it should be safe. Midoriya idly tapped the Omnitrix, and I'll do my best to stay out of trouble. Apparently, the security provided was enough to satisfy Aizawa, who gave Midoriya permission to quickly go to the store. He could have requisitioned some rope from the school, but the performances were technically supposed to be created using resources coming from the students, and that wouldn't be in the spirit of things. He was gone so quickly that he missed Nezu approaching his class with four familiar faces. That was close. One of those heroes almost recognized you, gentle. Fortunately, my dear La Brava, I am a master of disguise. Now, I believe there is a store nearby that sells some of my favorite tea. Shall we have some before our operation? Well, I suppose we have time, and it is on the way. Excellent. Izuku has the worst timing, Ben complained. We barely got here in time, and he left. Well, we needed the extra rope, Siro said, once he'd gotten over the shock of seeing the Tennysons. What? This rope. Ken held the two broken ends together, there was a flash of green light, and then it was good as new. One day, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you don't have to show off, Jen said. Ken grinned. Hasn't happened yet. Kara sighed. Anyway, Nezu asked us to keep an eye out, just in case. Is there an actual threat? Ida asked, then waved his hand dismissively. No, nah, we're just a precaution. We're mostly just here to enjoy ourselves. You know, Jen said with a wink, since we're Izuku's cousins, and all that. Ben nodded, but then his smile faded. And since we're caring family members, has he been okay? His arm and eyes bothering him at all. Yuraka immediately shook her head. No, he's been fine. Ben's relief was obvious. That's great to hear. Asmuth wanted me to check, and just asking me had me worried. And Dad's never worried, Ken Stage whispered. I'm sure it's happened once, Ben countered. I think. I can't remember when, though. Moving on, Kara said sternly, then pointed off to the side. We've got time before Izuku gets back, and I see some familiar faces. You kids keep getting ready while we go say hi. Ben waved the students off, then followed after his wife. Hey, Inko. Good to see you again. Inko nearly jumped out of her skin. Ben, Tara, I didn't expect to see you here. Oh, and you brought your children, too, that's wonderful. She gestured to the man next to her. This is my husband, Hisashi. The Midoriya patriarch smiled and shook Ben's hand. It's great to finally meet you. Inko has told me all about you and your family. He winked and lowered his voice, including the parts that I shouldn't repeat when there are others around. 
He did, however, bow. Thank you for saving my son's life. I'm glad we did, Ken said. He's a good kid, and he's gonna go far. Plus, we wouldn't have been able to save dad without him, Jen added. You kinda bond after something like that. Kara smiled and nudged Inko. How badly do you think Izuku will freak out when he sees all of us? Inko's grin was just short of mischievous. Considering that he has no idea that his father is even in the country, I'd say that today is going to be full of surprises for him. Midoriya exited the store with a bag in one hand, and his phone in the other. He had just finished texting Ida that he had indeed found some rope, and would be on his way back soon. He still had almost an hour and a half left before the performance, so his pace was leisurely, which allowed him to catch a familiar scent. An advantage of becoming friends with Yayorazu was that he had become familiar with many different kinds of tea. Her favorite, Golden Tips Imperial, had a distinctive smell that was almost as invigorating as the tea itself. Sitting at a table just outside the store was a tall silver-haired man, and either an extremely tiny woman, or a young girl, both of whom were drinking that same tea. The man, who wore a long coat and wide sunglasses that helped mask his identity, saw Midoriya staring, and raised his cup in greeting. Good morning, young man, he said, and between his voice and his features, there was something familiar about him. Is there anything I can help you with? Midoriya started. Er, no, I'm sorry. I just recognize that tea you're drinking. I have a friend who shares it with me. The man grinned. Oh ho, your friend has excellent taste. Some people think this blend is too rich, but I think some things are worth having, regardless of the cost. Midoriya wasn't sure how to respond to that. Yeyorazu always seemed to have her favorite teas on hand, and he had never asked how expensive they were. Then again, since the Yeyorazu family was rich enough to buy a medium-sized country, few things were expensive to them. The young woman coughed into her hand. We should really get going. The man froze, then nodded enthusiastically. Oh, you're right, my dear. So sorry, young man, but we must be on our way. Errands to run, you see. Midoriya had completely tuned his words out at that point. The voice, the mannerisms, the way he gestured with his hands, it all clicked together, and it made him tense. I know who you are, he said quietly. The couple paused. You do? The man asked. Tell me, who do you think we are? You're Tabaita Denjiro, Midoriya declared. Otherwise known as Gentle Criminal, which makes your friend Le Brava. If I'm honest, you're probably the only villain I have any respect for. I didn't realize you were a fan, Gentle said. Then not. You're a villain, you use your quirk to commit crimes, and you've hurt the heroes who try to stop you. The only reason I have any respect for you is because you never go too far, and you don't kill. Honestly, Midoriya had never thought he'd meet the gentle criminal. Like most kids his age in Japan, he'd watched the man's videos online, at least until they were taken down and saw him as something of a joke. He committed crimes, yes, and he'd knocked around the handful of heroes who had caught up with him, but he'd always seemed like more of a goofball than an actual threat. It didn't help that the heroes he'd fought were either brand new, or had badly underestimated him. Why are you here? Midoriya demanded. You're not robbing this store, so that's not it. You have to know that Yue is close by, and their security is some of the best in the country, so what wait? It was so unlikely that Midoriya had to believe that it was true. You're going to do something to Yue, aren't you? Gentle criminal swept off his disguise, revealing an outfit of mostly black and silver. The most eye-catching element was a long black coat, with a high collar and coattails. He then bowed and grinned at Midoriya. I assure you, my intentions are not to cause harm to the students. I merely wish to make an appearance, to prove to the world that I am capable of standing against the heroes entrusted with teaching the next generation. Midoriya slowly put down his bag, and shifted his stance, just enough to brace himself, while putting his left arm slightly behind. There was a beep as the Omnitrix activated, and the noise made Gentle take a step back as well. I won't let you do that, Midoriya said. His tone was calm, almost to the point of emotionless, a trick he'd been practicing since the work study with Sir Nidai. There are families visiting today. Anything you do could put hundreds of people at risk. I am confident in my skill, Gentle boasted, but there was a hint of uncertainty in his eyes. Just as I am confident that the heroes will keep the bystanders safe. Gentle, be careful, La Brava said urgently. She removed her own disguise, revealing a costume similar to Gentle's but with more pink to match her hair and her clothes were decorated with hearts. That's Midoriya Izuku. Ah, oh, I thought he seemed familiar. Gentle stroked his mustache. I suppose our plan must be adjusted. It is now a race against time, La Brava. We must complete our objective before this young hero can stop us. While Gentle spoke, Midoriya considered his options. Technically, this could be considered an emergency, which meant that he had the authority to act. Granted, he would have done everything in his power to stop Gentle and La Brava anyway, but at least he wouldn't be in trouble. 
He also wondered which of his aliens would be most useful. Despite watching the man's videos, Midoriya wasn't quite sure what Gentle's quirk actually did. He had even less to go on for Labrava. All he knew was that she did all the technical work. Might as well try to take him down right now. Midoriya lunged forward, transforming into wrath even as he charged. Gentle raised an eyebrow and made a tapping motion against the air between him and his attacker. Just as Wrath's fist entered that space, it slowed, then stopped as it pressed against a transparent disc of what felt like rubber. A moment later, all that energy pushed back, and that same fist snapped back into his own face. Oh, Wrath rubbed his jaw. Now he knew what it felt like to be on the receiving end. I do so dislike violence, Gentle chided. It's so much easier to have my opponent do all the work. My quirk allows me to make anything I touch elastic yes, even the air. Quite the handy power, wouldn't you say? Wrath says that you're gonna get punched in the face, gentle criminal. Wrath darted around where the elastic patch was and attacked again. This time, gentle touched the ground at his feet and then grabbed La Brava. He jumped a few inches into the air and when he came back down, the elastic ground launched him almost 30 feet up. Gentle then began placing more elastic patches in the air, creating platforms to bounce from. In moments, he was almost out of sight. Midoriya turned into Jetre and followed, hoping that he wasn't too late. Huh? Jen glanced at her brother. He had the semi-focused look Kryptonians had when they were looking at something too far away for normal people to see. Problem? Ken shrugged. I don't think so. Not yet. Anyway, Izuku has it handled. Jen raised an eyebrow, then used her own super sight to see what Ken was looking at. Oh, huh, see what I mean. Weird outfit. Please, compared to Creeper, that guy looks downright boring. I was talking about the girl. Oh, right. Ken paused. How does her hair not get dirty? It looks like it would drag on the ground. This world is wacky, and I'm not questioning it anymore. Good idea. With Gentle creating an invisible obstacle course behind him, Jetre couldn't risk following directly after him. Instead, he flew much higher always keeping the two villains in sight. When he got close enough, he started firing Nurishok beams, driving them down into the cover of some trees in a nearby park. Once he saw Gentle land, he swooped down after them. When he got close, he turned into Ghost Freak. His thinking was that he would possess Gentle and use him to detain La Brava. What he didn't expect was to get repelled by a patch of elastic air, even though he was intangible. How is that possible? Ghost Freak wondered incredulously. I should have been able to go right through it. Wait, I can pass through solid objects, but air isn't solid. Maybe his quirk just changes the way the molecules interact, making them elastic. He almost slapped himself. Focus, you idiot. I can't let him reach you, eh? If people get caught in the crossfire, it could be a disaster. Ghost Freak floated down to the ground, then turned into Armadrillo and dug through the soil. It took him less than a minute to catch up to Gentle and La Brava. He popped out of the ground and landed in front of them, then banged his fists together. Last chance, he growled. Give up now or I will hurt you. Gentle seemed to be rapidly considering his options and then settled on one. La Brava, darling, I need you to say it. La Brava looked between Gentle and Armadrillo and back again. Gentle, I love you. At first, Armadrillo had no idea what was going on. Then, a pink aura surrounded Gentle who drew back his fist and punched him in the chest. To Armadrillo's surprise, what should have been nothing more than a tap to him sent him tumbling backwards, end over end. Wait, what? His quirk had nothing to do with his strength. No, this happened after Le Brava said she loved him. Maybe that's the trigger for her quirk. It must increase the power of whoever she says that to. Rather than leave himself open by struggling to his feet, Armadrillo turned into Buzzshock and zipped back. He ended up bouncing off a tree which hurt, but it got him out of Gentle's reach. He then turned into Arctic Guana and shot a long cryo beam from his mouth. Gentle countered by reflecting the beam back and up with an angled disc of elastic air. Taking a page out of Todoroki's book, Arctic Guana aimed at the ground around Gentle and La Brava, freezing everything within 50 feet of them. Ice crept up their feet and ankles and would have taken them down, if not for Gentle's incredible strength. He shattered the ice with a mere shift and then leaned down to free La Brava with just as little effort. He placed her on his shoulder, then made the icy ground elastic, and used it as a springboard. Arctic Guana turned into Jetre and flew to intercept them, moving so fast that Gentle, who had just made another platform in the air, didn't have time to make an elastic barrier again. Instead, he simply tried to punch Jetre, who transformed into grey matter at the last second and ran up the man's arm. Both Gentle and Le Brava were so surprised by the move that they couldn't react in time, and Grey Matter punched the latter in the nose. The blow wasn't strong, but it did knock her off her perch, and she started to fall down to the ground. 
No, Gentle watched, horrified, as gravity took its due. He snatched gray matter and squeezed, and was rewarded with the sound of cracking bone. How could you? Despite his pain, Grey Matter grinned. Elastic floor, remember. Gentle looked down again, and to his immense relief, Labrava was bouncing on the elastic ice, none the worse for wear. Then he saw a flash of green light, and Big Chill slipped out of his grasp, and then turned into swamp fire to heal his injured bones. As the scent of methane reached him, Gentle recoiled. That smell is awful. Swamp fire smiled, even as he fell back to earth. It won't last long. Gentle frowned as Swamp Fire snapped his fingers, a single spark emerged, igniting the trail of methane, and causing an explosion in his face. It sent him plummeting back to the ground, but the impact did little damage. Between the elastic ground and the boost to his strength from Labrava's quirk, he was fine. He rose to his feet, just in time to get punched in the face by four arms. Stay still, four arms grunted, holding the man in place with two arms and decking him with a third. I'm not letting you get near you, eh? Gentle spat out blood and tried to headbutt the alien, however, he barely reached Four Arm's chest, and the boost to his strength only caused another grunt of pain. Four Arm's returned the headbutt, which sent Gentle tumbling end over end. Last chance, Four Arm's said and turned into Arctic Guana again. Either freeze willingly or I make you freeze. Despite everything, Gentle laughed. That, that is a terrible pun, young man. I must applaud you for saying it with a straight face. Gentle, Lebrava, slightly woozy from her long fall, staggered over. You only have a little longer to use my quirk. We need to get out of here. Gentle shook his head. I'm afraid that is no longer an option, my dear. I saw several heroes on their way while I was falling, and this young man will probably not fall for any of my tricks a second time. Seeing as how the two villains seemed to be ready to surrender, Articuana cautiously approached. What was all this about, anyway? I know you like to put on a show, but you had to know that attacking Yue was well, it was a bad idea. Gentle laughed tiredly. It wasn't like I planned for a protracted battle, young man. I simply wanted to prove to the world that I was not worthless. Despite himself, Arctic Guana winced. He knew what that was like, having been called worthless for most of his life. At least Gentle actually had a quirk, and wasn't a fraud, like him. I'm sorry, he blurted out. I know what it's like to want to prove yourself. Lebrava scowled. What do you know? You have the most powerful quirk on the planet. The entire world would be tripping over itself to make you their best hero. Arctic Guana sighed. Maybe now, but I couldn't actually use my quirk until about a year and a half ago. I didn't even know I had one. Gentle tilted his head. You thought you were quirkless. How did that happen? Unless oh, I think I know. That watch of yours somehow triggers your quirk. Yes. Yeah. My cousin figured it out and made the watch for me. It was starting to alarm him how easily he told that lie now. All I ever wanted was to help people, but it took most of my life before anyone bothered to help me. Gentle sighed. I sympathize. I only wanted to be a hero to help those in need, but I kept making mistakes, and every failure made that dream harder to obtain. Eventually, I dug a hole so deep that becoming a villain was my only option. And look how that ended. All three of them jumped when Ingenium stepped around a tree, hands on his hips, lying in the dirt, defeated by a high school student. I'll take it from here, Midoriya. But sure, Midoriya turned back to his human form. How long were you there? Long enough to hear the abridged version of this guy's life story. Ingenium shook his head. You're lucky there's a lot of noise at UA right now. That explosion might have caused a panic. Midoriya flinched. Eh sorry. Ingenium waved off his apology. No problem. Just finish your errand, and I'll take care of the rest. Th thank you. Midoriya paused. I don't think these two are that bad. Oh, why is that? Gentle criminal kept saying that he didn't plan to put anyone at risk, and just wanted to prove that he wasn't a failure. I believe him. I think he just keeps making the wrong choices, but he could be better. Ingenium's face was hidden by his helmet, so Midoriya had no idea what he was thinking. Maybe the police will take that into consideration. My job is just to get these two out of here. He paused. Maybe, if they're good, I can get back to UA to watch your performance. Gentle chuckled and held out his hands. Far be it from me to deny a performer his audience. Well done, young man. As a reward, I will not resist any further. Midoriya reflected that the entire fight had taken less than five minutes. And with plenty of time to spare, the performance went off without a hitch, much to the relief of Class 1A. Some of Midoriya's favorite moments were when Yuraraka used her quirk on some of the people in the audience, and then Siro used his tape to drag them through the air like balloons, and also when Ayama shot his laser at him as Diamond Head, creating an impressive light show. By the time the show was over, the performers were just as pumped up as the audience. Even Bakugo managed to not be grouchy, and they all hurried to get cleaned up so that they could enjoy the rest of the festival.
Izu, Chaco, Iri dashed over to them, her eyes wide and sparkling. That was amazing. There was loud music, and everyone was cheering, and, and, Midoriya lifted Iri up as the little girl went on and on about everything she experienced. He shared a grin with Uraraka at how happy Iri was. They had hoped for that kind of reaction. For the first time since meeting her, they felt like she was acting just like a normal little girl. Sorry about that, guys, Melissa said as she ran up to them. She was behaving herself, but then she saw you, and she bolted. It's fine, Uraraka said. Thanks for watching her during the show. Of course, Melissa glanced at her phone. Oh, I need to get going? The beauty pageant is starting soon, and I need to put on my dress. Break a leg, Uraraka called out, and tell Nanjire that we said that to her, too. We should hurry up here, Midoriya said, and put Iri back down. We promised them that we'd watch their show. I think we have about 20 minutes. Iraraka waved at Aizawa, who was nearby, to get his attention. Aizawa-sensei, can Izuku use his quirk to speed things up? Aizawa sighed. Fine, go ahead. Midoriya grinned and turned into XLR8. In less than five minutes, he had dismantled most of the stage and organized everything into neat piles that would be put away by some of Power Loader's robots. Why did we have to do anything before? Gyro Mok grumbled as she put away her guitar. It's a lot easier to take stuff down than put them up. Midoriya offered as he turned back to normal. Still, thank you for this, Izuku, Yeyarazu said kindly. Now, we can spend the rest of the day enjoying the festivities. Oh, Achako, wasn't there something you wanted to show him? We can look after Iri while you're gone, Siro promised, then took the little girl's hand. Come on, Iri, you can have fun with us while those two do gross couple stuff. Asui gave her boyfriend the flattest look possible, despite her face never changing from its usual expression. Gross couple stuff. What about us? Ribbit. Iraraka grinned as Siro floundered, and then started pulling her boyfriend along. Come on, Deku-kun, I have a surprise for you. Confused, Midoriya let her lead him into the crowd. After a few minutes, she brought him to a line of concession stands. It took him a minute to spot several familiar faces, but one was particularly noteworthy because there was no way he could actually be here. And yet, Dad, Midoriya Hisashi grinned. Hey, son, I'm guessing you didn't expect to see me, huh? Izuku was running before his brain registered what he was doing and collided with his father. He didn't even try to hide his tears as he hugged the man. After a minute, he pulled back and wiped his eyes. What? How? Why? He looked up at his father, then at his mother, who was smiling through her own tears. All the questions. I need answers. Your father got a transfer back to Japan, Inko explained. He'll be home a lot more often. Midoriya grinned so widely that it hurt. That's, that's amazing. Hisashi ruffled his son's hair. I think you had something to do with that. My boss is a bit of a quirk nut, just like you, and thought you were so cool. He probably thought I could introduce you, just so you two could talk quirks. If he's letting you come home, I'll talk about anything he wants. Ben coughed to get his attention. Well, maybe not everything, right? All right, maybe not everything. Izuku blinked. Wait, you guys made it. That took a while, Jen teased. Ken waved. Hey, dude. We saw your show, it was great. It was kinda cool watching a show that included powers, Kara added, then lowered her voice. We don't do that kind of thing back home. That makes sense. Izuku shifted to let his mother join in on the hug. Thanks for coming today. Kara smiled. Hey, visiting family is always fun. And the last time we went to Japan together, it was a lot more stressful, Ben added. You know, because we had to save lives. Can we do this more often? A man that Izuku now noticed had been hugging his girlfriend, and a woman who looked almost exactly like an older version of Achako chuckled. Considering what you and your friends did for my daughter, I'd say you have a standing invitation to come whenever you like. Izuku went pale. He had been crying his eyes out in front of his girlfriend's parents. Fortunately, Achako noticed, and she gave him her best smile as she tugged him over. Come on, Deku-kun, you need to meet my parents. Izuku nervously met Yuraraka Yukiko's eyes, and was relieved to see kind fondness there. H hello, Yukiko smiled. So, you're the young man my daughter is head over heels for. Achako sputtered. Mom, Yuraraka Tenma grinned. If you didn't want us to make fun of you, you shouldn't have told us so much about him. He winked at Izuku. You should have heard her going on and on about you saving her from that robot when you first met. Izuku saw his girlfriend pouting and took a chance. Did she tell you that she threw up on me when that happened? The older Yurarakas broke into laughter while their daughter grabbed Izuku in a headlock. Considering that I saved you from falling on your face twice, I think we're even. Hisashi shared a grin with Tenma. Oh, that's cute, they're keeping score. Think maybe we should keep track for them. Tenma asked, 
Dad. Both teens shouted at once. Tabaita Denjiro. Gentle looked up as Ingenium walked into the interrogation room. He sat down across from him, arms loosely crossed. I heard you confessed everything to the police. Gentle tried to muster up his usual pomp, but it was obviously forced. Well, yes, I suppose that it was the honorable thing to do. I felt so moved by that student's courage and determination, you see, and I couldn't let him feel like a failure because I was let go by a technicality. There was a pneumatic hiss as Ingenium's helmet detached in several pieces and folded into a slot in his armored collar. That's a neat feature. Thanks, it's new. Without his helmet, Gentle could see Ingenium's kind eyes. I also heard something interesting. Oh, that you tried to take all the blame for that friend of yours. You tried to tell the police that you brainwashed her and that she shouldn't be arrested. Gentle's eyes were as steely as any determined hero's. Because that's what I did. She wouldn't have been drawn into a life of crime if not for my actions. Ingenium sighed. Funny, she tried to tell the police the same story. Only that everything was her idea. What? Gentle rose to his feet. What is she thinking? If she does that, she could be throwing her whole life away. She's probably thinking you're doing the same thing. Ingenium said mildly, then gestured to the chair. Why don't you sit down? We'll be having a very interesting conversation in a minute. Gentle blinked, but then saw an intriguing light in the hero's eyes. Despite his panic, his interest was piqued, and he sat down. Speaking of that kid who stopped you, Midoriya Ingenium leaned back in his seat. I managed to catch his performance. Being the showman at heart that he was, Gentle couldn't help but be curious. What kind of performance was it? And was it good? It was a concert, a band, singing, dancing, lights, the whole nine yards. And it was pretty good, for something they only practiced for two weeks. Gentle nodded in approval. And then the door opened again. He nearly jumped to his feet yet again when he saw La Brava being led inside. She looked completely defeated. But when she saw Gentle, her face lit up. Gentle. She sprinted over to him and hopped into his lap. Are you okay? Did they hurt you at all? If they did, you could use it against them in court. I am completely fine, Gentle assured her. My only injuries came from the fight earlier today. Ingenium coughed to get their attention. Could you two please sit? This is going to be important. La Brava reluctantly got into the only empty chair in the room, and the two criminals waited nervously. Ingenium rose to his feet and slowly paced around the room. You two are something else. On the one hand, there's enough evidence of your crimes, evidence that you posted online, by the way, to easily get you sent to prison for a good 20 years. However, you've shown that you never use lethal force, heck, you barely use enough force to knock someone out. This is in direct contrast to how skilled I know the two of you are. Tabaita Denjiro, quirk, elasticity, was expelled from school, but it's on the record that you wanted to be a hero. You tried to help someone in trouble and accidentally got in a hero's way. Your intentions were good, which was why you didn't get more than a slap on the wrist, but interfering with a hero's work can lead to being socially ostracized. You've got at least 20 counts of robbery, illegal quirk use, resisting arrest, and assault. Aba Manami, quirk, love, got top marks in high school, and could have been accepted into almost any tech field you wanted, but basically vanished off the face of the earth. The next thing anyone knew, you were hacking computer systems across Japan, and a few beyond our borders, apparently. You're also an accessory to every single one of Tabaita's crimes. Ingenium returned to his spot across from the pair, but remained standing. Basically, you've got two options. Option one, you go to prison, serve your sentence, and when you come out, you spend the rest of your lives trying to find a job like normal people. Oh, and you'll probably never see each other again. Gentle shared a worried glance with La Brava. And the second option, the second option is more interesting. Ever heard of the anti-hero program? I do a bunch of paperwork, and you basically go on probation as sort of psychics. If you do well, you get pardoned, and you officially become my psychics. After that, you might even become pro-heroes yourselves. He dropped the easygoing persona for a moment, and leveled the most intimidating glare either criminal had ever seen. And if you step out of line and break my trust, I'll do everything I can to see you two get put in Tartarus for the rest of your lives. Despite the threat, Gentle couldn't help but feel hopeful. Why would you give us such an offer? As you said, we have committed many crimes. Ingenium sighed. Blame Midoriya. The kid got you talking about how you got dealt a bad hand, and it got me thinking. Maybe you both deserve a second chance. Besides, I've seen your quirks, and you're both talented enough to be a real help, and my agency could use a technical specialist of Abasan's skill. So it's not just out of the goodness of your heart, La Brava accused. Ingenium shrugged. It's that our prison, I have nothing to lose by you refusing, and a whole lot to gain if you accept. La Brava considered it for a moment, then looked at her partner. I'll go with whatever you decide, gentle but I think it's a good deal. 
I must agree, the thought of imprisonment is not comforting, and we have a chance to do some good. Gentle wiped away a tear, and it is not often one gets a chance to pursue a dream thought lost forever. Sounds good to me. Ingenium clapped his hands together. I'll get the paperwork in here soon for you two to sign, and then we'll get you out of here. Oh, one more thing, Tabaita san. Yes, you might want to drop the criminal part of your handle. Not a good name for someone who wants to be a hero, right? Gentle laughed, though it was broken with sobs. Yes, I suppose that is true. Midoriya waved goodbye to his family. The Tennysons would head to his parents' house in the car, and then Ken would take them back to their own universe to avoid suspicion. What's up, Deku-kun? Uraraka looped her free arm through his while her other arm carried a sleeping eerie. You look really happy. I am happy, Midoriya said. This was this was a really good day. Ben was still smiling when he went into his kitchen that night. Considering how quickly Midoriya's life had gone from boring to fighting for his life, it was good to see him handling it well. He was just about to open his fridge when he heard a noise from behind him. Years of spending time with Batman had taught him to recognize footsteps, and those didn't belong to his family. He whirled, ready to transform, until he saw who it was. Paradox, what are you doing here? Ben's eyes went wide when he saw blood dripping down the time traveler's hand. What happened to you? It is of little consequence, Paradox said, though for the first time in the decades Ben had known him, he sounded shaky. My friend, it is as I warned you. The great crisis is on the horizon, and it is time to gather the champion's destiny has decided will defend all of reality. Ben closed his eyes, his good mood gone. No pressure for them, right? Indeed. It is only the fate of all that ever was, is, or will be resting on their shoulders. Paradox put his uninjured hand on Ben's shoulder. Tell your friends to be ready. I will return soon. Ben blinked, and then Paradox was gone. Nice to see you too. The music starts, and Midoriya jogs through the street in costume at night, followed by the other rising stars. As they run, the darkness is pushed back, and across the buildings are images of them fighting the eight precepts. When they pass by, the images shatter, then reform into pictures of them relaxing and having fun at school. When Midoriya stops, it is in front of Yue, and the doors open for him and his friends. There is a bright flash of light, and then nothing can be seen. When the light fades, we see Eri opening her eyes as she falls from the sky. She seems confused at first, but then she sees Cellophane, in costume, but without his helmet, falling next to her. He grins, and then grabs her with his tape. He pulls her close, ruffles her hair, and tosses her to Froppy. She spins around in midair, then lets her go, where she is snatched by Virtus, his engines burning through the sky as he carries her to Genesis, who hugs her tightly and kisses the top of her head. She then hands her off to Alien Queen, does a backflip with Eri in her arms, then lets her gently fall down a slide of ice and into Triumph's arms. He smiles, and then tosses her to Uravity and Deku. Each of them takes one of Eri's hands as they fall to the ground. Following after them on the ground are the Big Three, Red Riot, and all the heroes involved in the raid. They slide to a stop in front of Yue, where the rising stars land, Eri hugs Uravity and Deku with a huge smile on her face, while Hawks flies above them all and grins. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 14. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.